tonight we have the joint facilities presentation and um, name, address, and title for the record. Welcome. Welcome. I'm Welcome. Doug, I'm Doug Maxellen from the uh, from your facilities committee. I, I'm one of the representatives. And um, I'm Donna Suzak. I'm the chair for joint facilities. But I just wanted to um, sit up here with Doug and give a little brief interview, um, overview of what we've been doing and kind of give an idea of what the importance is, is that what Doug's bringing forward to you. And also, we want everybody to understand that we are looking at things that were done before. And you'll, you'll, the mic is on. OK, so joint facilities. Bed and Town Council um, Committee. Initially, this committee was formed in July of 2016 in response to a failure of two referendums, the performance contract and the $41 million facilities upgrade, major maintenance, and securities referendum. So this committee met, and then in 11 November of 2016, the facilities had brought forward with the help of clean energy, and we passed the performance contract. When the performance contract passed, all the work was done by that, that from April of 2017 to March 2018. So far, that's been a success garnishing us savings of between six hundred and seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year then bring you forward again to um, November of 2017 we have another failed referendum and with that failed referendum for JFK there was an expansion of the um, facilities to include two four representatives from town council and four representatives from board of ed and an increase in the number of citizens and that's when doug first started on the committee so fast forward from there the uh, referendum passes in november after facilities takes it and becomes the pre-ref committee for jfk so this committee has done a lot of things where we've had to take failed referendums look at them a little bit different light and bring them to the people and with their grace we have passed them and we're moved along so now we're tasked with the master plan and it became really obvious from day one that the schools had fairly consolidated their services and how they provided everything in the town has way too much real estate so with that we were tasked to hire a consultant to develop a master plan for the um, town buildings. And um, unfortunately, when you're dealing with about 40 buildings and a budget of $100,000, no one's going to look at every building for you. So this um, committee looked at some of the things. And Doug visited the um, transfer station and brought it to us that the transfer station is in need of upgrades. I think the important thing for that is that this committee says that there's certain things that we intuitively know that we are going to need and they're probably going to stay where they are. One is the transfer station. We have a couple other buildings that we'll talk about later on. But at this point, I think I've said my spiel about how hard this committee works and I'm gonna turn it over to Doug. All right, thank you, thank you Donna. Uh, if everybody wasn't here again, just to repeat, I'm Doug Maxellen. I'm part of your facilities committee, one of the members. I think we got 15 representatives, including some staff. And like Donna said, we've gone through a lot of stuff, but we're, tonight we're just going to focus on the transfer station and some of the improvements there. It's it's a short PowerPoint. It it's kind of a little on the high level side. It doesn't get down into the weeds too far. But uh, once we see this, if there's questions, we can go from there. The date. I apologize for the date because we were originally going to present this before election and then we decided to hold off till after election in, in case counselors changed, which some of them indeed did. Uh, so that way everybody will get the information firsthand. So with that, I'll, I'll just go through the, the presentation and uh, take any questions as we go along. Okay. Uh, obviously, for those that don't know, the transfer stations on Town Farm Road, kind of halfway between uh, uh, Raffia and uh, uh, Abbey Road uh, on the north side. 
This is a, an overview map, an aerial shot of it. You can see the entrance down on, well, it's on my right. I assume it's the same on that side, too. You show the dog park there. Uh, and then we come up to the scale house. The scale house area is pretty much the area we're going to be talking about under this, uh, under this proposal we have here uh, tonight. This is a little closer look at, at the scale area that we're concentrating on. This is the existing facility. You have a, a scale used for weighing the vehicles in and out. Uh, that's that kind of red with blue stripes on it there, you see. There's a scale house, which is really an old, uh, old construction trailer that was, that was put there for our, uh, our employees to use. And then their bathroom facilities is, is that outhouse there in the, next to the scale. Uh, that's the existing conditions. Across the street from that, uh, kind of below the power lines, is where you, you would go and drop off your electronics and some of that type of material that doesn't actually go into the dumpsters for transfer. Uh, this is a, uh, some shots of the existing uh, conditions that are there. Again, on the top left, uh, uh, it, it, it's really an old construction. From what I understand, the history of it was a, it's an old construction trailer that was kind of handed down uh, and put over there for our employees to use. Uh, it's, it's really in pretty rough shape, uh, uh, even the foundation underneath it, you know, it's, it's up on cinder blocks. It really doesn't meet any of the codes or seismic requirements or wind requirements today for the trailers. Uh, it has a power supply as it shows down in the bottom left. Uh, again, the outhouse, the, the portable outhouse is, is what our employees use uh, for their daily, uh, daily use of in and out. And they use that all year long, unfortunately, including through the winter and through the hot times. And the bottom right is just another shot of that, that same trailer kind of catching the scale, uh, which you can see is, is right in front of it there. Uh, I was able to get a shot of the roof uh, off, a, off a monitor they have there. And you can see the roof is pretty well rusted through up there. Uh, it's deteriorated pretty good. You know, talk to some of the employees. They do get a leaks and stuff in there occasionally. So it's, it's something that's, you know, it's gone through its life cycle, I think. The center picture is, is another shot of the scale. The scale is actually good condition. It, it's, it's running. It needs some maintenance, some uh, TLC on it. But for the most part, it's, it's in good condition. And it's being used all the time. Uh, again, like I talked earlier, behind that pickup is the, are the boxes where the electronics, the TVs, and all that stuff go in when we drop them off there. And again, the bottom is just another close-up of that, uh, that trailer that our employees use there. The trailer's not very big. It's probably about 8 feet wide and probably about 15 feet long, uh, what they got now. No bathroom or anything inside it, no running water or anything. They use some bottled water in there. Okay. Some of the condition or some of the issues that we wanted to address by the facilities committee, again, the existing trailer's in extremely poor condition. It was a hand-me-down from an old town construction project. Trailer uh, roof is very deteriorated. The supports kind of under the trailer are, are failing and need some work on them. No toilet facilities for employees working at the transfer station. Uh, we use the temporary uh, outhouse there. It's a single way scale. Uh, single way scale is an issue for heavy volumes times such as weekends. Uh, there's no backup scale when problems arise on a single scale. Uh, from what I'm being told, residents are allowed to go through free when we take the scale down for maintenance or if the scale goes out on its own for service. Uh, <clears throat> there's no, <clears throat> excuse me, there's no domestic water for employees to clean up. There's only bottled water we bring in there and, and they use that. Uh, there's no locker, shower, or changing area for employees to change out of their dirty clothes, their dirty work clothes, or if they get contaminated on the job. No extra storage for rain gear or winter season clothing. There's no locker or anything in there. There wouldn't even be room for something like that. Three employees pretty much share the trailer per shift. Uh, you know, granted, one of them is kind of out on the site, and pretty much two are there all the time. But then the third one comes back when uh, when he does his uh, his task out on site, and, and usually there's three of them in there. There's no place to put janitor janitorial supplies. There's no lunch area. Employees pretty much sit outside, or they sit in their car and eat lunch. Uh, no water source for fire protection. <clears throat> Uh, you'll see in, in, our, in our proposal, what we want to do is when we bring the water up is to put a hydrant up in that area so that when there is an incident, uh, either fire or some other incident, there's water there for uh, the fire apparatus to use. There's, there's no camera system that covers the host site for monitoring blind locations or after hour, after hour monitoring of the facility. 
and there's really no site lighting for employee safety there to keep the area lit after hours uh, for security reasons. Uh, back in 14, uh, uh, the, the town had hired Fuss and O'Neill to do a, a design on, on the site here. Uh, this is what this is one of their their plans that uh, we were able to get to use. So they pretty much designed the land the the transfer station as we have it today. Uh, so what we did is <clears throat> we're building off of that everything pretty much north of that red square where the work is going to be for the trans for the scale house is going to stay. There's really nothing changing up that way, and that's how it runs today, except for the exiting of it. Right now, when you do your dump up there, you pretty much turn around and come back on the driveway that you came in on. Uh, there's a little better view of it with some color on it. You can see the dumpsters in the top right. Those are the green items. Uh, and the yellow is the drive area. So the drive area would be like this if this plan goes through, so that one scale would weigh you in, the other scale would weigh you out as you go through the facility. Uh, these are some ideas that we, we picked up from some other way stations in different areas. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're looking at like this. Uh, nothing fancy, it's, it's really a building. They're called scale houses typically. Uh, they're either a trailer type unit or a modular type unit or uh, they can be stick built. But these are just a couple samples of, of buildings. This would be a sample of the inside where you would have a place for your, your electronics that does the scale weighting, weighing and so forth uh, and, a, and a work area for the, our employees that are there. Uh, some of the stuff that we would like to include in a new facility, a new building, like I said, either modular or stick built to facilitate public access, staff working conditions, and automated operation at two scales with minimal employees. Uh, we also we want a place where the public can come in when they want to take out their permits and, and do any paying or, or have discussions with the town employees. Right now, they pretty much have to either out their car window or stand on the scale and uh, and talk to our employees. Uh, we want something obviously to build to meet uh, current building codes, OSHA requirements, seismic and wind requirements. Uh, we want something with a HVAC system so that it, it has heating and, and cooling properly for that uh, particular scale house. Uh, building to have public counter scale control and monitor work area, restroom facilities, locker and changing area, shower for cleaning or emergency use of contaminated, janitorial storage, and a small area for lunch, uh, a small storage area for lunch and eating area inside the trailer so that they have a, a proper place. Uh, like what I mentioned earlier, when we bring the water main up from uh, Town Farm Road, it'll be for domestic water supply in there for obviously the shower, the bathroom, and, and for drinking water and so forth. We'll have a sewer disposal system. There is no uh, sewer line on Town Farm Road from uh, what I've been told, so we'll have it'll have a small septic system up there to take care of that uh, scale house building. There'll be a small area to accommodate public employees and equipment parking. That'll be a small paved area at the scale house. The rest of the facility, the road coming up from Town Farm will stay gravel as it is now. Uh, there's no intent on in paving that in this project here. Uh, we wanna add a, ve uh, a vehicle way scale. So we have uh, two scales. Uh, we'll have an in and out scale and we'll also have a backup if, if one's down. They could use the other one for in and out temporarily rather than let uh, people go through at, at no charge. Plus it'll help on weekends uh, when the traffic is a lot heavier at certain times of the year, we'll have uh, 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 both way scales there. The other thing <clears throat> we're talking about is rearrange the transfer station specialty containers. Take them away from where the scale house is and put them on Fuss and O'Neill's where they show them on their plan, which is down the road on the left-hand side. So they'll have their area, the tra they'll be out of the way to do their, uh, their drop-off and it won't interfere with the scale house area or the scales. And like I mentioned, a hydrant for water supply during fire and emergency incidents, it'll give us that up there. Now the budget. Uh, we put together a budget. I worked for Public Works with, with Don and Jeff and, uh, and our committee, and, and we put together this budget that we feel is, is pretty good to take care of this. Uh, and I'll just run through it quickly. Site and work, site work concrete and paving, 165,000. 
the water main uh, with a hydrant from Town Farm Road, 145. That's a long run down there. That's kind of why that drove that cost up a little bit. Again, a small septic system for 13. A new uh, new vehicle scale, adding the new one is about 78,000. Um, move and service the existing scale about 13. We got to kind of shift it around if we put a building in between there. Uh, and then it, we'll give it some service so that bring it up to uh, its current needs. Uh, the scale house, about 52,000. Uh, scale house building, the FF and E, that's the furniture and the fit out inside and, and some stuff, about 8,000. The electrical lighting controls and cameras, about 24,000. An automated gate system is 20,000. That's the gate. There's currently a gate there now, but uh, we had talked about uh, automating it so that it's. Uh, able to close and open, uh, they can do that remotely from there. Uh, some design and engineering to kind of pick up on Fuss and O'Neill's plan and, and enhance that to include the building and, and the added scale and stuff, about 37,000. And then we ha have, have a little contingent, contingency in there for un unforeseen conditions, about 10,000. So we're about 565,000 uh, is what we're proposing for a budget uh, to do this project. So some of our next steps, uh, you know, obviously the town manager has got to be in agreement, the council, we've got to get some funding. We'll contract with a designer and engineer to take the plans we got and move them forward. Uh, we'll need to get deep approval. Uh, and uh, I think Don's had talked to some of them off, off, offline and, and they're pretty much in favor of this or that way. Obviously we'll have to get uh, the building department and and fire department approvals for what we're doing there with the building and stuff. Select our contractors and vendors, start construction, and complete, <clears throat> complete the project. We put together a little schedule, a little high-level schedule. It's a month off because of we shifted this meeting. But pretty much, you know, going through what I had said previously, you know, we're hoping to have it done in, in June or July if, if we get the funding and that they can move forward. And that's it. <coughs> Questions? Thank comments? you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Councilman Mangini, then Councilman Bob. Go ahead. Thank you um, both for the presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, just a couple of um, brief questions. <laughs> <coughs> Doug, you mentioned no camera system, no lunch area, and you, you spoke on a septic and you spoke on sewer. Which is it? Is septic or sewer? It'll be a septic system. There is no sewer in the area. That's what I was trying to say. Okay. Town Farm Road doesn't have a sewer line. Okay. So, so uh, it would be septic. Yeah, so we'll have a small septic for the uh, scale house up, up in that area. And the lunch area for the employees? It'd be inside the scale area. Okay. The, the scale building will accommodate the lunch area, shower area, you know, place they can clean up, place they can store some of their personal belongings and so forth. And the camera system? The camera system will will be what we were talking about is around the trailer area so that we can monitor it it can be monitored off-site and then over uh, looking over at the, at the drop area uh, where the where the dumpsters are in the transfer area really it's 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 probably more useful <coughs> for off hours monitoring so for vandalism and so forth than it is for on hours because you have employees there so is this budget amount sufficient to handle yeah, we, th we think it is. Uh, we went through it. We worked with uh, Don and Jeff at Public Works and, and our committee, and uh, uh, we feel it's, it's sufficient to do this. Again, it's, we're, we're not looking to, to build a Taj Mahal there or nothing. We just want to improve what's there, go with the second scale, and, uh, and, and improve the kind of the working conditions there. Now, at what time frame do you need direction from council? Well, if I can get it tonight, it would be great, but I know that's not possible. So as soon as, soon as we can, uh, th you know, through the town manager, uh, you know, I, our first step would be to get the engineer back on board and, and solidify the plans and stuff like that and then move through based on that schedule that I, I showed here pretty much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Councilman Bosco. <clears throat> well, I, th I think it's time that we, gotta have, we have to do something for them employees down there at the transfer station. But I am still, and I always will be, against that second scale. Okay. I, I think there's, you know, it, it, it's not a ton of money, but, you know, everything adds up. And for the amount of times we need that second scale, I think we could do things a little more wisely. And I don't, 
and I could be wrong, but I don't see a reason that we need to weigh leaves every vehicle that comes in. And we grind them up, we sell them, and we weigh them when they leave. So why do we have to weigh them coming in why do, and then, then weigh them again when we leave when we could just probably weigh them when they leave? And if you did that, that would take care of all our congestion at the dump. And the, the, I don't know how often, and I'd like to know how often that scale breaks, but we're going to go refurbish it anyway because you got money in there for it. The amount of times that it breaks where we let someone go in, how much money are we really losing? You know, again, I, I, I understand, but you got $78,000 for the, the, uh, the scale, right. but that doesn't count how much money it costs to bring the road to the scale and how much money it does for site improvements to put the scale in. So, you know, that 78,000 realistically could be 100 grand. And, you know, we need to get the employees a safe, clean place to go. I just don't see that that scale at this time is really something we really need. And, you know, we're going to have a tough budget. So, you know, beggars can't be choosers. We, we have to find this money. So I, 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 I just, I support the issue, maybe not to the, to the um, extent you have, that I could be, we could we could talk about, but the the scale, I, I just like to see if there's a different way of doing it, and I guess that probably could save a hundred grand. Okay. Thank you. Just, just to clarify that the the foundation and everything for the new scale is in that budget also, so there wouldn't be added costs. Well, no, but you got to put a driveway in, you got to put a road in. That, you that's, got, a, that's all incorporated in this to a, accommodate that second scale. You know, uh, that's counting the blacktop going to the scale and the blacktop leaving the scale and all the site work yes to put the scale in yeah this budget covers that around that scale house correctly yeah but I I, I hear I, I hear your point I, I and, and not that I'm doubting you Doug but I, I would really have to see the numbers on that because usually they'll have the scale and they'll figure out you know the wiring of the scale and the foundation for the scale but they don't put the blacktop and all the other stuff to come in and out of the scale in the same price <laughs> of the scale. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Engayer? I was just curious, does the current scale house have air conditioning for the employees? I think it has a small air conditioning like a unit, little window, window, unit. window type wall unit. Yeah. yeah in, okay. in the, it's like a construction trailer type uh, unit. Deputy Mayor Suzak. I guess what I would like everybody to understand that the reason we're bringing this forward is number one, it's something that needs to be done. Number two, it's under the referendum limit. So it's something that we can be looking at in at budgetary times. So we'd like to kind of get a blessing to move forward with the design before that. The other thing is, I don't know if everybody captured the fact that this was done in 2014. And I think that this council and particularly this committee have done a lot to um, rejuvenate things that need to be looked at. And we need to look at all the things that we need to do on a yearly basis. Because in 14, we decided not to do this. We should have looked at it in 15, 16, 17, 18, but we are looking at it in 19. And I thank Doug for bringing that to our attention. Okay, you're welcome. Anyone else? My only question, Doug, first of all, thank you. So with the second scale, any is the public works done any analysis on the possibility of improving service times so i get the idea for the second scale but i mean I, and i know when we get close to three o'clock on a saturday i heard from a lot of people when they cut it off you know obviously that makes a lot of people upset but hopefully maybe we've done and maybe it's more of a question for public works if we've actually taken a look at our improved you know service times as it, you know, if it say it takes on average on a Saturday when it's busy an hour to get in, I'm, I'm just throwing numbers out there. Yeah. They get through. If we have a second scale, it's down to a half hour. I don't know if we've looked at that or not. Uh, we haven't, as as our facilities committee. No, we haven't. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure if, if uh, Public Works through uh, as operations have looked at it uh, different right. ways and All stuff right. like that. Right. Yeah, I know. I know Donald. At some point, that'd be a, something maybe we could talk to. I mean, I think that'd be key to kind of to Joey's point if we're going to spend 100 grand or whatever it is on another scale. If we improve service, there's some justification for that. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. 
Would it take uh, another employee if you had two scales? So are we talking about, you know, having another employee working? From what I understand, no, it wouldn't. Okay. Chris. And this is a concept I would like to thank the Facilities Committee for all of their hard work and acknowledge that, um, bringing this to us. And I think it is fortunate, Donna, that at least they did the plan in 2014, so we have a baseline to proceed from. But I will tell you, this can't be looked at um, alone. Right. The town attorney's office is currently looking at the recommended changes from the solid waste ordinance. Hasn't been revised in 20 years. Uh, there are state statutory changes that have been mandated that we have not incorporated. So that's kind of a usage and, and you know, um, the ABCs of it. But also we've got to look at and I've had this discussion with Mr. Nunes over the last year, um, that a lot of our other policies, procedures, permitting, and costs of the landfill are woefully ancient. They're as ancient as the pictures of the equipment. We're, we're um, not collecting the revenue stream. Now, I'm not going to say it would pay for this, but over time it would. And it's a significant am amount of money that we haven't looked at. And while we don't want to have increases, what we're doing compared to surrounding communities um, we're not capturing the revenue that we should to justify and to be able to pay for the infrastructure that we need to maintain going forward. And there's no dispute. Anybody who's been there, everybody from the town, the pictures you've looked at, I think most of this equipment had reached its life expectancy when they put it into service 20 years ago. It, it, it not only is a bit of an um, embarrassment, but it also does pose you know, challenges to our, our employees who are out there. It's not acceptable. When you go out there and look at it for a town of our size and the services that we offer, I've looked and talked to Donald and gone in the area. I've never seen uh, a situation that is as dire as this one. So we have to address it. But I, I think that we also are going to look at these other areas. And much as we did with fuel usage, unfortunately, we are way behind the times uh, in, in, in terms of decades on what we're charging and the permitting and what we're <laughs> allowing to go on out there. So we could capture a lot of revenue that would not only pay, help pay for this, but sustain it going forward. So we'll be bringing that forward, too. Susan. Doug, could you go back to the f um, fee for the design? Because I'm thinking that at this point it would be nice if the the council maybe had a consensus that we might bring to the table um, a design that perhaps incorporates, you know, the the question of do we need the second scale and um, how can we get this designed such that we can move it forward into the next budget? So, yeah, if you look at item 10 on there, that's, design that's their design and engineering. <coughs> it was the 37,000 uh, that we were looking so at. We, Again, we, for this area, you know, if we're going to expand the scope, like, you know, if we needed to for, for some other reasons, obviously that would change. But Right, but I think at this point, it would, the, what we need is we need this council to decide that this is something that is important, you know, to us. And I... I'll tell you, I mean, there's there's no handicapped accessibility there. There's nothing there. I mean, it really Even is. Even if we have to do it so we can fund it over multiple years. Correct. Right. We need to at least find out the information. Right. But I think at this point, I think it would be nice if we could, you know, at least get to the design stage so that we could bring it forward. Um, at budget deliberations, we always throw stuff on the wall and see what sticks. Well, what we could do, uh, knowing the cost of design and engineering, we can look in, in public works to see what money is available, bring that forward to the next agenda, right. um, so at least we could look to, to take the 2014 plan and update it, get in put in the subcommittee as to the scale. Donald does have opinions about the leaves and the second scale. We can bring all that, and that way we'll know the cost to go forward. Um, we can then have a consensus on what we really want to have out there. We'll get a price. And then it's it's a perfect timing because we will be then entering the budget for next year, and we can decide if we want to do it and how we want to finance it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, okay. sir. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you. We have uh, um, one minute left. Do we have a motion to adjourn a special meeting? Okay. Councilor Muller. Second. Second by Count Deputy Mayor Suzak. All in favor of closing the special meeting. We have one minute before we start the regular meeting so folks can stretch their legs.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, call the uh, regular meeting of the Enfield Town Council. Tonight is Monday, November 18, 2019. Uh, 7.05, Prayer, Councilman Bosco. Dear Lord, with Thanksgiving coming next week, we need to take a moment to offer prayer of thankfulness. We are thankful to live in the greatest country in the world. We are thankful for the blessings on us and the opportunities for us to bless each other. We are thankful for our community here in Enfield where we raise our families and celebrate friendships with so many. We are thankful as a town council for privilege to serve our neighbors. May you continue to bless our nation, state, town, with your divine hand. In the Lord's name, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Roll call, please. Councillor Bosco. Here. Councillor Sakala. Here. Councillor Hemler. Councillor Kiner. Here. Mayor Ludwig. Here. Councillor Mangini. Here. Councillor Muller. Here. Councillor Riley. Here. Councillor Ferraza. Here. Councillor Suzak. Here. Councillor Ungar. Here. Moving on to item four, the fire evacuation announcement. In case of a fire, we do have exits at the back of the, of the hall. Please orderly go to the left or to the right. Or we have an exit right out to our left, your right, down the first, out the door right in the hall, down the, down the stairways and out into the parking lot. Moving on to item five, minutes of preceding meetings, a regular meeting October 21st, 2019, to have a motion to approve. By Councillor Muller. Seconded by Councillor Sparaza. Any additions, deletions, changes, or uh, omissions from the minutes hearing none by show of hands all those in favor opposed abstentions seven in fa uh, eight in favor three abstentions moving on to item six special guest and i apologize in advance i should have practiced his name before you put this on the agenda it won't help because i've been <laughs> I, i've been trying to, to say it all day long and uh, i come are, up with a different we are welcome way every time michael Fino finoya all right, Superintendent of Water Pollution Control. Come on up, sir. And when he gets up, I'll just give you a little background. And we wanted him to come uh, forward and welcome him to the Enfield community. Well, welcome, sir. Welcome to Enfield. Thank you for being um, here tonight. And Donald, uh, I'll let them speak. But I just want you to be aware that, you know, with the upgrade of our Water Pollution Control Center, we're one year into the two-year upgrade, almost $40 million. It's going to be state-of-the-art, uh, and it's been underway. But as with anything else, you know, facility is only going to be as good as the person who's running it. So we've been looking for a superintendent. Um, and in Enfield, we do keep our uh, searches. We want the best person. We want the best qualified person for any job. So we scoured the state. Now, we'll just tell you the way the state works. You need a person with a certain permitting level, uh, a, a permit for in Connecticut. They're very hard to get because Connecticut, it, compared to surrounding states, and we know this because we met with the deep while we were doing this search, we have very exacting standards and professional standards for somebody to attain that. It's very difficult given years of service experience. The testing is quite grueling. So these persons are very uh, highly qualified and they're highly sought after. So we did a search, and Mike had come to speak to us, and we, we worked with him over a period of time because he had a very good job downstate. Um, but ultimately, um, he came and looked at the facility. He spent a lot of hours. He was really interviewing us, I think. And he thought it would be a good fit, that we had really <laughs> remarkable people there. It would be a good challenge coming forward. I had to uh, allay his fears because, as you know, in the last budget, we didn't add um, the uh, recommended positions that Novak they they've recommended we add five people to water pollution control. So I think he was a little taken aback that we are uh, we have a, a deficit there in personnel. But I assured him he would come on, get the lay of the land, look at it, and then make a recommendation to this budget to try to be in accordance with Novak. Because again, we don't want to spend 40 million and then not maintain and properly uh, repair the facility uh, so that we get the maximum life expectancy out of it. So. Uh, he's here. I'm very happy that he came. We, we let him settle in for a few weeks. I, I want to make sure he was staying before we brought him up. And I think he's worked well with the staff. They think highly of him. Donald does that uh, 
rain event we had a few weeks ago was really trial by fire. I kept on calling Donald to say, did he come in this morning? Because it was quite a challenge, uh, especially with we had some people that were out. So he really proved himself during that period of time. So I'm very excited that he's here. And I will turn it over to Mike and to Donald. Welcome, sir. Hi, how you guys doing? Good, how you doing? Good. Again, I just want to thank the, uh, the people in the town of Enfield you know, for having me uh, during the, the process where we got together and talked. I was very impressed with, uh, with Donald and Chris and down at the plant, uh, gentleman Mike Dudek. I don't know if, if you're familiar with him, but I, I've been to a few plants and uh, he's a very special person, you know, and it makes me feel, feel very good to have someone like him there. Uh, one of the things that I was excited about is the, is the upgrade. And uh, some people wouldn't feel that way, you know, because of the things that go on. You have to, it's not like you're building a new plant next to the existing one. What's happened is you're, you're working on the one that is working and the state of Connecticut and EPA says that you still have to meet your permits. You know, so it becomes a bit of an inconvenience for, you know, a lot of different folks. The contractors want to get things done in their timetable. And our guys are still trying to do a job while this is all going on. You know, one minute there was a pipe there, and the next minute you turn around, you come back, the pipe's missing again. So it's, uh, it's one of those things. And, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm very excited about this, the, the opportunity to... Uh, you know, to get in, involved and, and do a little thinking. Uh, we went, we sent a couple of guys out today to, you know, do some inspections of the lines and uh, they found a couple of things out there. So that's one of the things we're also going to try and set up is a proactive, you know, programs uh, in the collection system, the lift stations at the, at the plant itself and uh, suppose, you know, hopefully head a lot of things off and, you know, give you guys the plant that you guys deserve. Thank you. I thought we banned that cup from the table. Uh, no? All right. Sorry. Go right ahead. Sorry, I followed that. I thought we put that in a minute. He says this now because they're not playing exactly up to <laughs> Bruins fans' standards. Yeah, we we'll we'll see at the end of the, of the year anyway. So go Bruins. Uh, <laughs> I can't pick on him. I'm a Miami Dolphins fan. And he's a Dolphins fan, so I know it's. We're still Whaler fans. For the record, we're all Whaler fans in Enfield. Go ahead, Ed. Sorry. So I just, again, I just want to say thank you to Mike for coming on board and staying on board through some very difficult opening month or so. Again, like Mike said, he's not just, he's not inheriting a building that's already operating and the systems that are already in place. These are ever changing by the moment kind of things and having to make certain then that the permits are being kept, we're doing the right sort of things to keep making our reports as good as they are. Um, it's been a challenge. There's been no, there's been no shortage of challenges, and he's been doing very, very well responding to them. We've had staffing issues. Uh, we've had some folks out that have been hurt, and our staffing levels are, we're at one point down to two people a day. I mean, we normally have, you know, we have two operators, and that was for first shift. We should have 11, nine, or I'm sorry, 10. So we had between injuries and just sicknesses, and it's just. It's been a challenge, and I really applaud him for doing that. I've been speaking with uh, folks in the field that work closely with everything we do, and they've been doing nothing but rave reviews about Mike, about his knowledge of you know the systems that we don't all want to talk about because, again, you folks don't think about it. You, you flush or you're, you're washing the thing, and it all goes away. And, well, you know, it does. It, 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 it all yeah, goes away. And when it doesn't go away, then that's when everybody starts thinking about it. But. Um, Make sure you have that on the record right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, he comes with a very good understanding. What's that? Who runs down hill foot backs up? Occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> Less little lift station. But, again, we I sincerely appreciate all he's done so far and his abilities, and it's been, it's been very good. So. And I would like to say, Mayor, I would just like to thank all of the employees uh, at Water Pollution Control, as Mike and, and Donald said. You know, any of you have done home improvements or repairs, you know what it's like to be in the house or whether you're doing a restaurant or a business and have people tearing down walls. And here they've got cranes and bulldozers. You know, it's quite a disruption. And then when you uh, superimpose the um, shortage of staff and the rest of it, it's been very, very trying. And I would like, I know I've done it in email form, but um, 
I would like to uh, especially thank Michael Dudak, who stepped up doing his job and then taking over the management position for several months when all of this chaos was going on, being shorthanded, not having signed up to do that, and he did an incredible job, and we really all owe him a debt of gratitude, so I'd like to publicly thank him for his extraordinary efforts over the months before Mike came on. So, thank you, everybody. Any questions? Councilor Connor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a question, Don. We also said as a pollution control authority on, on the council, <coughs> and the budget for pollution control is a pretty good sized budget, and it's a very time consuming um, aspect as well. I'm wondering if any other towns our size have a separate pollution control authority separate from that of the town council. I mean, we're inundated with so many other things, and I, I know a lot of us on this council have expertise on this matter. I don't, quite obviously. And I'm just wondering if other towns have set up, and what maybe what you're feeling is, on setting up a specific authority. Uh, Mr. Mayor, that, I would just say that we're here to welcome Mike Fiona. Those are appropriate questions. We're looking at it, but we're not in a position to have uh, Mr. Noons opine on that. We're, we're gathering information uh, for the council to look at, and we'll bring it up in your goal setting uh, when we meet uh, in December. I did not necessarily mean him to answer the question tonight, Mr. Okay. Town Manager. All right. But I think this is a question that needs to be addressed by the town council at some time at a later date. Thank I you. Concur. Anyone else have any questions? Welcome, sir. Thank you, Thank you sir, as well. Thank you very much. Go Bruins. Yeah. Thank you. God bless all of you. You as well. Thank you. Moving on, I, again, I apologize in advance, but I've been practicing. Cynthia Guerreri, Director of Social Services. I uh, see that. Two in a row. I'm done. Come on up. She's going to come up also with PM Brown. He's going to accompany her. Good evening. <laughs> And she likes to be called Cindy, so. And I'm glad you went first on both names, because it saved me, Mr. Mayor. Welcome. I would just like to say again, uh, just to preface, we thank Pam Brown for coming back out of retirement um, to steer the ship over the last several uh, weeks and months, and she's even volunteered to stay on in a transition role. And I'll tell you one thing I think that we do well with HR and personnel here is we get really, really good people, but we have really, really good people who are leaving, and I think it's a testament to the organization that are willing to stay on for weeks and months afterwards to properly train because they have so much love of the job, the town, and their co workers that they want to make sure that their successor is uh, successful in their endeavors. And I think that's a real testament uh, to our town government. Uh, and Pam has come back out of retirement to do that. She's willing to uh, stay on, and we thank her for that. We did a very uh, wide and broad search for director of social services, as you know. It is a critically important position. It's one of the largest um, departments in the town, oversees everything, as we know, from the youngest of our community to the oldest in our community, everything in between, all sorts of programs. Programs. There are all sorts of federal and state requirements. It is heavy re heavily regulated in all areas um, that she will oversee, uh, and Pam knows that all too well. We had a very good search uh, a committee. We looked at the uh, group that we had. We had some good applicants. <coughs> we then brought together we we with. Pam sorted through them, took the top applicants. Then we brought a group together of not only uh, directors from the town that had experience, but we brought in stakeholders, um, persons from the Commission on Aging, persons from Kite. Uh, Pam sat in. We brought in directors from her department, and we had a very large group assess the candidates, and there was a great consensus for Cindy. And I'll tell you, I was very uh, impressed, and she's going to give you a little overview, but she's been in the private sector. She's been a person that has been involved in helping people directly through her uh, a therapy. We'll let her talk about that. But she's dealt with the young, the old. She's dealt with state grants. She's been in <coughs> private business. And one of the things that really rang with me is she said she was going to look at the organization from top to bottom. And one thing we've talked about is, is there a duplication of efforts? Do we have nonprofits in town that are offering a service that the town is that we're sort of in competition? She's going to look at that and say, well, look, maybe this is something you do better. We could pull back. Or vice versa, there's an area that we could concentrate better on and offer a service to a portion of our you know, uh, community and, and let others offer other services. So I think that's important. So I think bringing that uh, public sector with private is going to be a great insight for her going forward, and uh, we're very happy to have her. With that, I give you Cindy and Pam. Welcome, welcome both. How are you guys doing? So I've been here for about uh, two months now, and um, there you have to welcome Cindy.
duty to the department, and um, I'm going to let her. I'm going to let her introduce herself. But um, we've been meeting on a daily basis, and um, I've been introducing her to the uh, division heads, and um, and. Uh, I'm very happy that we have Cindy here with us, and she'll tell you a little bit about her background. And yeah. Great. Good evening. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, and thank you for letting me have Pam for a period of time. Um, I'm five days in, so bear with me. But um, what I am impressed with day one and, and all the way through is the commitment of the team that I'll be working with. Um, the longevity of the team, the the care they have for one another, emailing each other kind of like, you know, wow, you did a good job. So there's some genuine caring, um, which is great to know, especially the job that we have in serving the families and, and children and adults in the community. Um, my background is a little bit, I did clinical uh, social work, the therapy aspect, that's my background. Um, I shifted out of that and into managing programs uh, very heavily initially in the early childhood realm, so I'm very f versed and familiar um, with early childhood, youth service bureaus I've worked with across the state. Um, personally, I've navigated systems for elderly care, working with my own parents. Um, so I love the idea that the town is organized, that it's cradle to grave, as they will say. Um, and so I feel excited to dig in deep and see um, how we can work efficiently and effectively and compassionately. Thank you. Very well, thank you. Anyone have any questions? Councilman Bosco. Thank you for coming and thank you, Pam. You, you've been there for us anytime we needed you. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Happy to be here. <laughs> I just want to say welcome and also great to hear you thinking about, you know, you know, looking at things holistically, because mm -hmm. there is a ton of money in the private sector mm -hmm. that's willing to donate and to mm -hmm. set up programs that we certainly haven't tapped into. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and again, care programs for all ages, but certainly for seniors and others that, I mean, it really is an untapped resource of revenue that it's out there for communities if they're willing to kind of you know, spend a little time to, you know, to yes. do that sort of thing. So it's great to hear that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. Thank you very much. Moving on to item seven, public communications. Uh, we ask folks to refrain from personality. We have an hour uh, from 7.20, so it would be 8.20. First, would anyone like to uh, speak before the council? Welcome. Got five minutes first, go around in three. Thank you. Yeah. I just really come with excitement. Um, my name is Joan Lawson, um, 18 Mountain View Ave. And I'm actually coming to represent maybe one of the aspects of the faith community. Um, I just want to share a little bit about um, the Enfield Youth Rally that took place um, at New Day Church on November 6th. Um, and our presenter was Dr. Michael Ferris. Um, it was called A Journey to the Potter's House. And his presentation was done using the actual potter's wheel. And it was for our youth of Enfield. And actually, there were 227 uh, attendees at this um, event. It was very successful. And um, we just, seeing that the church is coming together to put this on for our youth is such an inspiration because um, we know that making a healthy community and um, we really um, heard a positive message of hope from him which was very um, I don't know again inspiring I was kind of one of the worker bees uh, in, in planning all of this but I really look forward to other opportunities to impact our youth and um, our community with such good messaging <coughs> And we hear lots of bad news all the time, but I just felt really strongly I wanted to come and share something good that was happening among our churches in our community. And I really um, just uh, am so grateful that we do live in a community in Enfield that we're so proud to be a part of. 
So that's what I would like to share. But I also, um, other pastors wanted to be here tonight, but they had other obligations. Um, Sister um, Frances from uh, Little Sisters of the Poor actually sent me an email and she said, would you read it tonight um, at the council meeting? Um, because I can't be there. She said, it was, a, it was great to be a part of the youth rally for Enfield and, and, by, um, and, and on by faith leaders from the churches in Enfield. Thanks also to some of the members of the Enfield Council for being there. It was so inspiring. And watching the kids, they were very intent and absorbed in what doctor was showing them. I couldn't stay for the discussion because of other duties I had had. I heard from several um, that they thought it was very thought provoking and gave them a lot of food for thought. Hopefully they can put it into, into their lives and it can be of help in sorting out the things that come in their daily lives. So that was from Sister Frances Elizabeth, uh, Little Sisters of the Poor. And I'm going to turn this over to our other faith person. Hi, my name is Rosalind Swift, 14 Gary Road here in Enfield, Connecticut, representing Ministries of Love and Hope as one of the faith churches here together. And we have been working quite a long time together, which is very, very, very important. I think it brings uh, a sense of community, a sense of hope. Um, I'm talking about the, I let the, one of the groups of the young people. They were engaged. They were willing to be open. They shared about their struggles, anxiety, um, depression, peer pressure, all the things that we hear anyway, all the things that we know about. And it's just wonderful that the churches are coming together now to be able to support our young people in these areas. I mean, it's it's a lot going on. Suicide here, and, you know, just anger and frustration. So. I'm just coming also as a person that's been a part of the faith community, you know, to let uh, our town officials know what's going on. And we're really glad about it. We're really happy that the churches are working together and really we're looking forward to doing more things together. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. So just a good note of good things are happening, so stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you both. Anyone else like to speak for the council at this time? Welcome. Hi. Thank you very much, Shannon Grant, 49 Yale Drive. First of all, congratulations to everyone sitting up there. You all look great. <laughs> Um, I'm here for two reasons this evening. Um, I am on the Board of Health. You may be aware of that. Um, I've taken on the responsibility of the Capital Improvement Committee. I will be putting together a capital improvement plan and budget for the Health Department with um, Patrice. We're working on that already. And also be the board oversight for the renovation for our district headquarters right down the road. So if there's ever any concerns or questions, I'm happy to be here and, uh, and chat with you about that or be a conduit to Patrice if, if necessary or take questions back to the board. Uh, with that, um, I'm also here to talk about a possible um, initiative that Kelly and I have uh, started working on. Um, a couple of days ago, I saw an article, uh, I believe in the Hartford Current, from Simsbury Library, who has created a closet of durable medical equipment. And come to find out, we actually have something like that here in Enfield, um, and it's in the Senior Center. A couple of years ago, almost 10 now, my daughter was in a terrible scooter accident. She broke her arm and her leg, uh, was unable to use crutches, and was in desperate need of a wheelchair. Um, we had a difficult time finding one at the time. There was no similar closet here at the time. So when I heard that the senior center had something, um, and I tagged Kelly in my Facebook post and ultimately got quite a bit of feedback and support, including, and I didn't ask his permission, but he's here this evening. Chris Rutledge volunteered to help out as well. Um, we thought that it would be a great idea for the two of us and, and if, if need be, a committee to help ensure that our closet is as robust as it possibly could be. 
um, and that being the case, um, get some PR out there that it does exist because perhaps um, while maybe the senior center may know about it, uh, the community at large may not. Um, and in fact, I did a little search today and the only place it is referenced is on the senior center newsletter on page 14. It's about a one inch article, you know, just, just a little note. So it, it does need a little more PR. Um, that being said, a more robust program probably needs a little more administration. So I've started looking into what other towns are doing in terms of application, uh, deposits, and, and you know, um, need-based support. So um, I'm looking forward to working with Kelly as my new district person. Um, and uh, I hope to have your support in this process, our su support. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Anyone else like to speak? Mr. Young. Welcome, sir. Thank you. George Young, A. Holly Lane, Enfield, Connecticut. Uh, good evening to the town manager and uh, welcome to the newly elected and continuing members of the council. We all need to get used to the new seating arrangements. Well, I guess the euphoria of uh, one, the one week honeymoon is over and the real work probably started the day after the election. Tonight I'd like to ask for a follow up on the Commission on Aging's progress on producing the so-called Blue Book, which former Councilman Crisati was monitoring. As a reminder, it was last produced in 2012 and it is an invaluable tool for the seniors in this town. On a further note, I hope the new council will continue to support the assistance for the elderly and disabled in the form of tax credits. As I mentioned at the December 3rd, 2019 meeting of the council, we have two former council members representing us at the state level. So perhaps you could convince them to get their colleagues to support restoring these funds by the state to their mandated program to lift the burden from the town. There has been much discussion in the past year of the Water Pollution Control Department. Once again, certain members of the council at the last meeting suggested that the council should not be running the WPC, which I certainly agree with. It was suggested that a committee be formed that that group should monitor the WPC. I'm sure most people would support Karen LaPlante to be a leader on that committee because I know of no one who has come forth to the council with more challenges to what is going on in the last year of the missile plant. On a side note, for those that read the Hartford Business Journal, November 11, 2019, it was interesting to read that the Hartford Metropolitan District Commission, which is MDC, faces challenges similar to Enfield and other water and wastewater utilities all over the country. This is a critical problem with an aging workforce. I think they have come across an interesting approach to this program. The NBC has partnered with high schools and towns in the towns that they served to develop a curriculum for a unique partnership called Learn and Earn Project. It is a four week paid summer internship. Enfield has hired a number of employees after extensive searches and perhaps the council, the town manager, and the education department could look into a program similar to this which would be a win-win situation for the student and the town because everyone does not go to college or it could be a stepping stone for those that want to get into that career. It was welcome news that Mr. Bronson has completed the search for a new well-qualified director of social services for the town. I did note that her salary is slightly higher than the amount shown in the 2020 budget, although I realize that amount will not exceed that this fiscal year because of the number of months left. I am concerned that for what we are paying, we get her full attention because she is also, and I want to quote this, the founder and president of Essential Outcomes, a talent consulting firm where she resides, which provides professional coaching, collective impact planning, evaluation and metric, governance, governance structure, design, and other resources for nonprofits, community collaboratives, school systems, and municipalities." End of quote. These are certainly a lot of other jobs, and it makes me wonder if there are co potential conflicts of interest here. 
Will she still be doing these jobs, and will it be while she is working as the Town of Enfield's Director of Social Services? I do not feel comfortable, and neither should the Council, unless there is a more clarity than what has been written. Uh, with a six-plus million dollar budget, <coughs> it requires a full-time director. I would appreciate if the Council would just follow up on this matter to a, make us assured that it is a full-time job on our behalf. Every month when the agenda for the town's regular meeting is scheduled, there are at least two of the five pages filled with openings for the town council appointments and town manager council approved appointments. They always appear under the old business. I would like to challenge all the newly elected council members who receive so many votes to put them in office to reach out to their districts and convince some of the people to be on these committees, boards, seconds commissions, et cetera, to fill these vacancies. What a great time it would be for you to go back and reward your neighbors with a chance to serve the town. Perhaps you might even mention that some of the voluntary jobs might get a property tax deduction. The town would be better able to speak about that than I. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Jack. Welcome. Jack Sheridan, 7 Buchanan Road. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate all you guys. Uh, great job. And I mean, it, it, it's amazing that what you have to go through <coughs> in order to serve your town, but I appreciate what you do. And I don't always agree, but I appreciate it. You know that. You're, um, you're a very wise man. <laughs> I, uh, I, I come before you tonight because all, all of the literature I got in the election process was raving about the sinking fund. The sinking fund is nothing more than a device to get around the will of the people. Because the will of the people, according to the town charter, says that we have to vote on referendums to spend the money. And the sinking fund was devised to get around that. It's not the intention, and I, and I brought a copy of the of the uh, referendum to clarify it. And uh, section 9, section 10 talks about both the expenditures and how it should be brought to the, to the, to the uh, referendum. So this suggests then that the only thing we really get to do is vote for you. And you need to serve the hardworking taxpayers of the town to make sure that they continu continue to be able to afford to be here. And so when you come up with these things that are wants and not necessary, think of all the people who voted for you who faced that decision in their budgets. You have to accept, separate wants from needs. And I see more and more of the, oh, I'd want that. It's, it would be great to have. And I, I don't deny it would be great to have, but not when it affects the hardworking people. Someday, when I become a uh, senior citizen, I might need some of these facilities. So, you know, I know that, you know, that's <coughs> truly a possibility. And I, I, I extend the thanks to Pam, too. She, she's been a wonderful person and, and supported this town for so long, and I've had some dealings with her, and excellent, excellent person. Um, but getting back to the sinking fund, I, whatever happened to the thing that we didn't, we weren't supposed to carry budgets from one budget to the next, from one fiscal year to the next, and yet now we're doing that. The school doesn't do it, but yet in the form of the sinking fund, we're doing exactly that. And I really do think it's a device to get around the voters. You think about it incrementally, you could spend however much money you want and never have to go to the voters again for a referendum. So that's my speech for tonight. I still welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Anyone else like speak for the council at this time? Bob.
Welcome. Bob T. Katz, Enfield. Welcome. Somewhere in Enfield. The, the voice of Enfield. Uh, you know, I want to welcome all of you. you. You've done a great job, all the new members. I hope you continue that. Uh, I wasn't here last week. I had to work. Uh, three things. Uh, school security, it's not a secret anymore. Wall Street Journal published all the secrets. So by saying there's secrets, we should see where the expenditures are so we make sure that they're budgeted properly. So school security is being published out in the open. Um, secondly, Longmeadow has had a problem uh, on tr trying to get people to recycle. So all the uh, advertising and everything did, hasn't worked. So what they did, they took all the tipper barrels back and gave them 45-gallon tipper barrels. And if they had excess rubbish, they'd have to buy, buy a blue bag. So they're going to have to pay their share on excess trash. So that's the way to go. All, all the cajoling with people and everything, it's not going to work. But 80% of all rubbish is recyclable. Uh, I passed out a, the school enrollment form just to give you a comparison. Back in the early 70s, the school, Enfield School District had over 13,500 students, the 2,000 in the parochial schools. Now we're down to less than actually 5,000. And that's typical across the state of Connecticut, across the nation. Uh, what's happening here, uh, last year you had uh, 5,070 students, and 40, 45 of those were in special programs. Now in special programs is up this year to almost 80. So you still have 5,015, but the overall total is, is down below 5,000. And where the, 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 the biggest decrease was, was in the middle school. I know you're building a middle school to have uh, additional students, but the, typically the middle school is down considerably. Uh, it was 1149 last year. This, this year it's 1078. And it's, so where is that going to be in the future? If you look at the, at the 19 <laughs> on K through 3, this year it's 992. Last year was 1046. So even though um, the state census or the state estimates say that Enfield's population has pretty much stayed the same. They don't take in consideration the downsizing of the prisons. And we don't, they don't know that number. They haven't taken that number. I know it was at one time it was almost 20,000. Now it's less than 10,000. And if marijuana becomes legalized, they're going to they're release uh, people out of the prisons like they've done in Massachusetts and expunge their records. So we should see less, less uh, less population so we have less needs of some of the services and we ought to look at all the services that you have and if we need less people in, in a service we should make a cut because the population is not growing in Enfield the, the state estimates say it's it's even but however you, there's going to be less less people in Enfield if you got to consider the the prison population. So I would start looking at all these departments and, and see we don't need all the people that we have in all these departments. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for the council for the first time? Anyone else like to speak for the second time? Pam. I'm sorry, Joan. Sorry, Joan. That's okay. Sorry. So I would just, um, Joan Lawson, 18 Mountain View Ave, um, I would just, I'm coming forward as chair of the Enfield Together Coalition. Uh, tomorrow we have a meeting uh, at 4 o'clock right downstairs in the Enfield room. And actually our enforcement is going to be uh, doing a, a K-9 um, uh, presentation. So if anybody is interested, we'd love to have you join us tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Mr. Young. Uh, George Young, 8 Holly Lane, Enfield. Uh, last month, there was $760,000 of unused appropriations from prior to June 
2016 that were transferred back to the general fund because no monies had been spent in over three years. I agree with Councilwoman Sakala that many of these funds could have been used if there was an awareness that they were available. Last month I suggested that the council should be notified in November of the current fiscal year if there are any of these type of unspent appropriated funds that would be scheduled to expire at the end of the current year. Are there any? If their funds are returned to the general fund as required, can you just reappropriate them this year or since they are not part of the current year budget, why aren't they used to reduce the overall budget? If you haven't spent the money on the property on the project by now, then you probably don't need them. Most of these unspent funds are in the area of construction services. Who should be watching these accounts? How could there be a budget for $221,000 for recreation access, dam, other professional, $182,000 for parking lot, ALAC, and Hazardville Construction Services, and 145000 for various drainage construction services that no one knew about or the funds weren't needed. This is all part of the budget process that more attention needs to be paid to going forward. At the October meeting, I had asked what all the stipends were for. I thank Councilman Sraza, who explained that what the stipends for the police department were for. And maybe more departments would like to explain what their stipends are for, and perhaps the Director of Finance could give us a town-wide total for stipends, and similarly for the Board of Education. As the Council prepares to review the next budget, they should be looking for consistency from all departments for stipends, or are they just part of the person's pay, which is probably where they should be budgeted. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for the Council? Going once going twice, declare public communications closed. Moving on to item eight, Councilor Communications, Councilor Ungar, Councilor Ungar, sorry, <coughs> then Councilor Mangini, Councilor Sparaza. Go ahead, you, okay, you go um, ahead. Right right, ahead. I'd like to yeah. uh, welcome to the new town council members. I look forward to working with all of you, so welcome. And uh, welcome back uh, the other councilors as well. Um, I wanted to thank Joan and Roz for coming tonight and talking about that youth rally. I had the privilege of being there. What an unbelievable event that was. <coughs> 227 people there. Wow. That, that was such a great turnout. And then you have volunteers, parents, uh, the clergy that was there. It was just a, it was wonderful. Uh, and I'm thinking of who's going to benefit from that great event. It's all our kids. You know, it, everything was positive, encouraging. You have a great future, and uh, it's just so encouraging. I think it really gave them something to think about. You could have heard a pin drop in that room. You throw a bunch of teenagers in a room, and rarely can you hear a pin drop, and, and that was the case that night. You know, there's enough negative opportunities that these kids hear all the time, uh, different avenues that they can pursue, directions they can go, and this was just a great alternative. So uh, I commend the churches for their uh, coming together and this is the first time this has ever happened in Enfield so it's a great thing so thank you for doing that and uh, keep up the good work Councilman Mangini, Councilor Sparaza and Councilor Kiner and then I got folks in here. Just a public service nice, excuse me, announcement December 7th Enfield Rotary is going to have a pancake breakfast at the Senior Center with Santa. Santa will be there and it runs from 8 a.m. till 10 30 p.m. The pancakes are phenomenal, and the fact that we're adding Santa should be a good draw for the kids, but it'll be fun. So I just want everyone to know we're having a fun day that day. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Sferraza, then Councilor Kiner, then Councilor Hel uh, Hemler. Okay. Um, just a couple things. Uh, this morning, I had the privilege to go up to Hartford and represent the town of Enfield at the CROG meeting for the Transportation Committee. And the subject matter, I thought, wasn't going to be that exciting, but as the more they spoke, um, it turned out to be a wonderful event. And what they were talking about was, apparently there's a problem statewide with chlorides getting into the ground from all the salt that DPW uses at wintertime. And the instructor was not suggesting by any stretch that we don't use salt. You need salt in New England. What he was talking about was focusing on anti-icing versus de-icing 
and he explained it pretty simply. Anti-icing measures is when DPW lays down the salt before the ice comes to help clear the roads. And then de-icing is once the streets are full of ice, you need a lot more salt. Uh, it's cheaper to do the anti-icing, and they uh, created a seminar or a school to try to help the towns. <laughs> and I was so elated to find out that our town didn't need to go to that school because we've already been doing that for years. So whenever I hear Enfield is doing something ahead of the curve, uh, I, I take great pride in that, and I congratulate DPW um, for that effort. The second thing I want to speak about is a little more somber. I, I do want to take a moment to extend my heartfelt sympathies to the families out in Santa Clara, California, where the two children were killed last week in a school shooting. Um, you know, it's so sad that we live in a time where every time this happens, we the same questions come out. You know, uh, how often is this happening? It can't happen here. Uh, you know, the reality is this year, according to what I found out, is that there's been 45 school shootings this year, and we're about the 46th week of the year, so we got one a week. 32 people have been killed, including children, kindergartners, all the way up to high school students. When we hear that, we all empathize with these people, and I can tell you, I spent a lot of my life every day worrying about a situation like that in our town. Um, last week, coincidentally, it was either the day before or the day after, we had an incident at Enfield High School. Um, our police department, when they do it perfect, maybe people don't notice, but that was according to all the training and general orders they have. They took it serious. They were aggressive in pursuing this, making sure the kids were safe. Communication was great, <laughs> and fortunately, they made an arrest on that. I can tell you that when I hear that commitment, people need to know there's no guarantee that we could prevent these tragedies from happening. But I'll tell you what, uh, Chief Fox and his men and women do everything they can, as the department has for years, on active shooters. And it made me all the more gratified that last year, this council allocated a quarter of a million dollars to increase our SSO program. Now all the schools in Enfield have a police presence of, of varying natures. You don't want to let the tragedy happen and then wake up the next day and say, did we do everything we should have done or could have done? Because I don't think there's anything more valuable than our kids. And I supported that program then. I will support it in the future. And again, um, I have such you're going to say, well, of course you do, but I do. I have such admiration for the guys in the police department having to deal with this, and believe me, they work on it all the time for something we hope never, ever, ever happens. But God forbid it does. We are in the best position um, because of that commitment. So um, I guess protocol is through the mayor to the manager to the chief. Uh, Thank you, Chief, for the commitment on active shooter and, and everything you do, because keeping the kids safe. And, and you know, it's not just the kids. Sadly, do you know we've had over 350 of these shootings throughout the United States just this year? So I don't have the solution for it, but we need to stay vigilant, and I think that's what we're doing in Enfield. So thank you very much. Thank you. Councilor Kiner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There are two issues I'd like to bring before the council. Uh, one is I got a complaint from a resident living on Stardust Drive uh, saying that um, she's complaining about, and I've noticed this too, as I'm sure many of us have, that people are not bringing their brown tipper barrels in on time, and it presents quite an eyesore. Um, I asked uh, our town manager to look into this, and he messaged me, uh, Bill, I understand that this recurs from time to time. As you know, education is the key. Well, hopefully a lot of people are watching this uh, council meeting tonight, and we're going to educate them. And I'd like to read this from the town ordinance. Per the town ordinance, barrels shall be placed at the curb between dusk, the day before your scheduled pickup, and 7 a.m., the day of pickup. All barrels need to be removed from the curb by 8 a.m. on the day after the pickup. And uh, 
This is a press release from the uh, Department of Public Works. He concludes by saying, be a good neighbor, please, and follow this ordinance. Uh, the other issue I'd like to bring before the council is there was an article that appeared in the local media about a number of dams uh, in the state of Connecticut that are referred to as high hazard dams. Uh, these are dams uh, that are prone to uh, uh, disintegrating or, or causing damage and must be inspected every two years uh, by the Department of Environmental um, Energy and Environmental Protection. Uh, there were 12 dams listed uh, by the state, and one of those dams is the Freshwater Pond Dam in Enfield, which I'm sure many of you probably are, are, are aware of. And the, the question I have is, uh, since DEEP is supposed to be um, inspecting these da this dam and the 11 other dams every two years, uh, are we keeping track of this? Uh, and if so, what I'd like to know is when the last time uh, this particular dam uh, was inspected and what the inspection showed. And if uh, the town manager or uh, staff can uh, get back to us on the council with that, uh, I'd appreciate that for the, uh, obviously, for the welfare and safety of uh, people living in the freshwater area. Thank you. Councillor Hamlet and Councillor Bosco. A um, couple things. Uh, this past Thursday, I had the honor of being at the police department and uh, saw two new officers being um, sworn in, a young man and a, a young lady, and uh, I thanked them for, for choosing Enfield and, and congratulated them. It was, it was an honor to be there. Um, Sher Shannon Grant came up and talked about uh, something that we've been talking about. Uh, I'm sorry that she left. Hopefully she's watching on TV. I think it's a great idea. I was glad to see that other towns were doing the medical equipment locker and uh, we wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. And then to find out that the senior center sort of kind of has that program. I love anything that's neighbor helping neighbor. So I hope that we can get that expanded and uh, you know other programs that really don't cost anything, but it's neighbors helping each other. Thank you. Councilman Bosco. Yeah, through the mayor to town manager. Um, a little while back I asked and I, I don't believe I got my answer. Um, one was a culvert under steel road that drains Edgewood Drive. And I asked if that thing has been checked because a few years back it backed up and when it backed up it flooded some basements on Edgewood Drive. <coughs> and uh, if, if we didn't, we need to get it done. It's the one directly across from 49 Steel. Um, then I, I know I talked to you about the uh, drainage in, on Farmstead and I never got an answer or anything about that. And then the next thing is um, we have been working on a solid waste. I was hoping that we would have had it done before election, but it never made it. And I want to try to get this thing started again uh, because this is going to have, when we get it done, uh, something that we're going to have to do with our budget too because there's going to be financial things. So we really need to get this thing done sooner than later so that way you'll be prepared for the uh, the budget time on that. So other than that, I'm all set. Deputy Mayor Suzak and <coughs> Councilor Riley. And Councilor. It's always a lot when we haven't been here for a while. Um, first of all, Mr. Sheridan, we're never going to get around referendums. Uh, referendums are for really large projects. <coughs> The sinking fund is really to get us to a point where we used to just put money in CIP for two years and then we would do the project. Um, the problem that we have is that we have a referendum limit that is tied to our grand list. And our grand list does not grow at a rate that the um, costs of construction grow, grow at. I haven't seen our, I mean, Construction uh, increases are 4% every year. Our grand list doesn't grow 4% nor 1% every year. If it grew 1%, we'd probably be all excited over it. So that being said, we're trying to do our best to get stuff done. Um, 
The other thing, WPCA. A lot of people want another committee because they think that it'll be easier if someone else does it for them. And unfortunately, every time somebody else does something for us that's setting a cost or setting some setting a rate for something, we end up, we're the ones who are going to have to explain what they've done and do the, take the consequences of what's been done, and they're not an elected board. If you want to have WPCA separate, we need to be a separate elected board that sits up here and runs every other year and is accountable for what they charge the people. And when you're charging the people monies like that, you need to really learn the budget. I might be kind of willing to do something like what we've done with the joint facilities where we send a number of um, town councilors that would be assigned that committee and we bring in some what I would call, you know, expert citizens that understand things a little bit better than we do and somehow work that kind of a committee together. But for me, a separate board that sets a rate <coughs> that is um, a significant tax to our people is not something that I would be in favor of. So I had a few things as I read the PAR that I just had a few just questions and clarifications to make sure that we have stuff. Um, the senior home repair. All the people that go into everybody's homes are covered by the town insurance. Because I noticed that they do things like cleaning rain gutters and <laughs> lifting out large air conditioners from windows. And I just want to make sure everybody's covered from an insurance standpoint. Um, and then I guess I'd like an update on the Henry Barner, the chimney. I gave an estimate in, but I thought it was kind of excessive. And I would prefer something to maybe be a repointing of that chimney. And since we've got to go back out with phase three of the Henry Barnard roof, maybe we get some chimney people up there and we, we finish everything that, that's up on that level. And the other thing is um, as we walk around and we, we campaign, we notice things that <coughs> now we're going to go for roads 2020. But I'm telling the citizens right now, you need to tell us like they did when Mike and I went out on Summers Road. <laughs> we were out there for quite a long uh, period of time. People aren't happy when they live on a really um, road that's in disrepair, but you need to advocate for your roads and you need to come and back up what we're saying. Because I, I have three streets that are, you know, Besides Summers Road, which to me is a main road, I have three smaller roads, which are Glen Arden, Homestead, and Willstar Circle, that I think have not been touched in 50 years. So there's all those, and when we do have public hearings, come out and advocate for your area and your street. And the other thing that someone pointed out to me when I was on Hazard Avenue is we have a magic carpet stop, but there's no crosswalk there. So you know, on smaller roads, it's not such a big deal, but on a road like Hazard Avenue, we might be best to um, coordinate where there's crosswalks and bus stops so that um, the tra flow of traffic is more, um, I don't know, cognizant of the fact that people might be crossing. And I, I know, Kelly, I'm kind of sad Shannon left because my other thing I want to ask for is I would really love to have the share of the roads painted on the road, um, the bike path on South Road. It is a designated bike path. It's eight feet wide. It's the only one that's legitimately a bike path on our town roads. It needs to have the share of the road on it to remind people to watch out for people and bikes. And then my favorite thing, motion to suspend the rules and move items. <laughs> 14A consent A1 through A3 and 14A appointments A1 through A4 D E F G to miscellaneous and proceed to vote. None of these are going to vote. They're not. You, you, you didn't move these, right? Four, five, six, or seven. None of these are getting. No, moved. one through four. Okay, got it. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to listen to me. <laughs> Motion made. Second. Seconded by uh, 
Councillor Muller to suspend rules and move the items to miscellaneous. Any discussion? Hearing them by a show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed? 11 in favor, zero against. Councillor Riley, then Councillor Muller. Okay, well, first, uh, now that I have a bigger audience to talk to, um, I wanted to let everybody know that we are looking for uh, people to help out with uh, first readers. Um, we have ceremonies, and we're going to be putting together our world famous trivia night. So, if anybody is interested um, in helping us out, that would be wonderful. We have um, a website and a Facebook page, and you can also send us an email, and we would be happy to have you join us. Um, I wanted to also commend. Uh, the police for this past Friday at Enfield High School, you guys did an incredible job. Thank you for keeping our kids safe. Um, then the only the other thing I wanted to address um, was Mr. Young mentioned about a blue book with a Commission on Aging for Senior Things. I haven't personally seen that, but I did hear recently that a while ago, we used to have a book that Social Services had that I think Amy Whitbro put together, and it had like every single department that we had and where you could go, here's the contact information. Um, and I think that that might be something that, since we have a new director of social services, I would definitely like to work with her to try to get something like that put together again because there is a plethora of services that we have in this town that a lot of people are not aware of. And I think that would be a great way to get um, the people more aware of that. And then just to echo off of what um, Donna had said, um, I think the sinking fund, I mean, I don't know if it's ever going to be able to go away, but I kind of look at it as like it's an emergency fund because we've only used that fund to repair an emergency to fix a leaking roof. And I don't think that's really a need. I think that's, I mean, not a want. I think that's a definite need. Um, so I don't, I'm not really sure if that will ever go towards wants, but it's definitely needed to be able to fix those roofs. Um, and that was all I had, thanks. Councilor Muller. For the mayor to the town manager, is there an update on the Route 5 pav paving project, when that'll start? Is it gonna start in April or? And when I was out campaigning, I met a lot of residents on Jewel and Sapphire. They were wondering, is there an update on the Abbey Road and Broadbrook Road intersection, the light, what they'd be doing there? Thank you. Sir, anyone else? I'm going to be very quick. Um, uh, I was at the uh, the rally, too, for the faith base, and it was great. And again, I, I, I want to personally ask all denominations, no matter what you believe in, it's a great program, and they all should be getting a hold of Joan, you know, because I think it's great to see, as we talk about people coming together, what better way of, no matter what you believe, the beauty of being an American, you can believe whatever you want to believe. And, oh, by the way, it's nice to work together with people who might believe a little differently than you. So, again, I recommend all faith-based leaders contact Joan because I think it's a great thing and it's something that separates Enfield, clearly, from other, other, other uh, areas. I want to uh, just congratulate the Moose Lodge, Kenny and Heather McDonald for having a Veteran Day dinner, you know, for folks, for our veterans in town. They put it together and it was a nice dinner for the, the veterans of Enfield. I also want to thank, and again, folks who put together the, very quickly the search for the, for the woman who unfortunately we have not been able to locate, but it came together very quickly. Tamara Holmes, Natasha and Melissa Baker, Lieutenant Petamani, Petamani, our CERT team, all the folks who got that together very quickly met over at um, the search over at uh, Columba Drive in that area, you know, you know, went out and did it. I want to thank the, uh, also the, the, the um, our private sector partners, Starbucks of Hazard Ave Step Up, Costco, ShopRite, Sh Stop and Shop, Ocean State Job Lot, Dunkin', uh, the Dunkin' Donuts from the Lulus, all stepped up within 24 hours and donated materials for people to be able to go out and search. So it just tells you how great the, the community comes together. Of course, the CERT team as well. That was done within, I think, 24 hours, and they had 60 volunteers. Fortunately, you know, we weren't successful in locating the individual. However, the, uh, certainly the, the, the means justify the ends here. And I'll just say, last thing, we're hopefully going to have these, this group for us within December. Congratulations to the Enfield Rambler C team. Went down to Tallinn and won the Super Bowl of the C team and represented Enfield well. Some tough kids. Again, as a former football player, it is great to see when they're down 12-0 to come back 
and we had one little kid, number three, run an 80 yard round the corner all the way down. His legs were running like crazy. And I'm telling you, it was impressive. And, and here's the thing is Enfield travels well, as I say it all the time. Place was packed with Enfield residents. Um, cheering on the kids who played great. They hung in there, they struggled early, and then they came and dominated the second half and won the Super Bowl, and they went undefeated. We're hoping to have those guys here with their coaches, hopefully within December, to reward, as we, as I always say, title town is what our nickname will be. Thank you very much. We move on to the town manager report. And uh, I know uh, your, your show, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the town attorney under her report will address the sinking fund issue briefly. Um, I'll start off with Councillor Bosco. He's always a challenge because Joey doesn't email, he calls. So it's tough to keep track when we've responded because sometimes he forgets and other times we are remiss. But in this circumstance, in the first issue we had asked, he can talk to Donald Nunes. Um, he recollects he had given an answer on the first one, but he can follow up on that. <coughs> in regard to Farmstead, there were a couple of issues that were similar. I sent out one email last week, and some of these, he's very thorough. He doesn't just give a knee-jerk reaction. We go out and actually um, do a little more research. He takes pictures on the farmstead because we had already addressed that last year, and I had said my instinct was that we had addressed and everything we'd done was appropriate and we should do more more. That opinion has been rendered by Mr. Noons. I think Kashi, uh, Mr. Noons sent it last Wednesday, and she just sent it out to the whole council, so those are answered. Um, Maybe we'll get Joey to email someday. Um, and I thank uh, Councillor Kiner for his educational um, talk on the tipper barrels. You know, we do have the right under the ordinances to do enforcement, but I think Bill, as a teacher, you can take the teacher out of the school, but not the teacher out of the counselor. So I appreciate uh, letting the public know, and I think that's the best route to go. Remind them we try to do that with Public Works instead of just going out and finding people. I think it's nice to try to educate them first. So I thank you for that, Mr. Kiner. Um, I will tell you it's interesting, um, and one of the issues was brought up by Mr. Young about uh, education, apprenticeship, and, and different things. And I'm proud to report when we had our economic breakfast, uh, the Commissioner of Labor attended. He extended an invitation to me to come talk to him. So I went to speak to him a couple of weeks ago with Steve Belinda uh, and talked to his staff about various apprenticeships and paid internships that they sponsor for business. I'm happy to say the two individuals responsible for those programs will be coming for a 67 special uh, to come and talk to the council, but more importantly, to let our community know we can put it on the website. And I'll tell you, after doing the economic breakfast, it was important, too, because we got a list of, uh, and the emails of hundreds of businesses who want to hear about our PAR, they want to get our quarterly news report, and these are the type of issues we'll then send them out the link to let them know that these appre apprenticeships are available. And I will tell you, they commended Enfield for its partnership in the high school with his Nuntuck. Um, and it's interesting because we do have a move, I think everything's retro, whether it's train stations or people wanting to go into trades and perhaps rethinking whether or not a formal college education is what they really need to do. And they commended us and the work of Mr. Dresick and the school on offering uh, and a degree and certificate programs at his Nuntuck for labor programs for people who want to go into the trades. And he remarked he's working on that and we're ahead of the curve in that like we are chief with so many other things. So they'll be coming and giving a report in January. Um, we will in December also be having an update. Mr. Noons will come. I think he gave a very valuable presentation last year on the roads uh, of the plowing schedule of us and the state and how that's done. So he's going to come and give an abbreviated to remind people because it's perishable, but people forget. And that will be a little addendum to the presentation last year. What I've also asked them to do, as Donna had mentioned previously, you know, if we are to consider a Roads 2020 project, if it is the will of the council and the desire of our residents <coughs> to do it for next year, um, the timeline starts really in January. We've looked up the old timelines and the public hearings and the input for people to opine and ask me to. I want to be on the list really starts in January. So in December, we're going to have the timeline because the election date hasn't been set for next year precisely. We'll work back in general because there's certain time frames you have to hit that you have to notice certain things and do certain things. But the time is now. If we want to do it, you can decide in December and then we could at least start the public input and we'll give you a list of the roads. Again, we did a or Public Works did a wonderful presentation of the history of the roads projects over the last 20 years. Um, that's on our website and it, it listed the roads yet to be done. We'll put those up at the next meeting, but also then those who want to be heard and, and lobby to get put on the list, it all becomes a function down the right of money. How much do we want to spend on the referendum and how much do the voters want to support? So that is uh, for your consideration. We'll have that in December as well. Um, 
We're also, and I will uh, comment just briefly, uh, I was asked, you know, we, we had an issue about going out to bid uh, on a realtor contract. Well, we're going to be going out to bid. We're not asking people to give actual financial bids, but request for proposal on the town attorney position because our beloved uh, Maria Elsden has indicated that she will be formally retiring from town attorney in January. She'll be staying on, and we're quite fortunate to have her being able to stay in a part-time capacity to help with the transition of the new town attorney. So, I'm saying we're going to put it in the newspaper, we're going to put it on the website, we're going to put it in the PAR. I'm telling the world as we sit here, lawyers usually don't do bids or requests for proposals either, but anybody out there in Connecticut that's interested. Usually in bed by now. Well, um, <laughs> it's going to be a two-year term. It's from December 19 to December 21. Uh, there are some requirements that's contained what the charter provision is and the job description and what the salary range will be. So anybody that's interested, and I'm sure that Jessica Lerner will be doing an article that to talk to uh, Maria about her 30-year uh, career with Enfield, and perhaps she can also put in a little, she asked me, what else can you do for bids? Well, Jessica, here's your opportunity to help us, and you can put it out there, and hopefully we'll get a robust response for our next town attorney. Um, in regard to uh, sinking funds, we touched Farmstead, Henry Barnard. I've been speaking since uh, we spoke, uh, Donna, and Mr. Nunes has chased down all of the options. He has a couple of proposals and a recommendation for the subcommittee or joint facilities, and we were saving it for them, but he has a recommendation that I, I think is cost-effective and makes sense. Um, Last, I hate to have to address it publicly. You know, we welcome somebody here, we do a search, we welcome them with open arms, and then somebody asks, do they have a conflict of interest? I don't know. It's a little disappointing. Anybody can ask that. But I will tell you that uh, Cindy was gracious. We interviewed her. One of her strengths was the fact she had her own business. We coincided her start date with when she would terminate and conclude her last client. She's not going to be taking any others on. I think it's unfortunate to cast out aspersion and ask if there's a conflict of interest and will she be working full time or doing other work during the day. I would hope you'd think you have enough um, confidence in me and the HR director that we consider those things when we hire people. We don't pay them salaries over $100,000 uh, and then expect maybe they'll show up uh, when they're not working their other job. We do allow directors, I will tell you, uh, to sometimes consult and do outside work with my permission if it doesn't conflict with their job, and we, we know that going in. And we have some directors that do it because it helps them in their professional development. It enhances the stature of Enfield uh, in, the, in, the, in the state. But in this case, she is not going to be taking on any new clients. And again, I think it's unfortunate tonight we welcome her. She has to sit and hear somebody question basically uh, the integrity of the choice. I'm very disappointed. But it's everybody's right to speak, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for the town manager? And... Just two questions, sir. Just one question, Chris. I, I should have addressed it earlier, but in the PAR report, and I'm not critical of it, I just need an answer. On page 15 under the Public Works, where it says fiscal year 1920, year to date, overtime comparison, um, if you look at the custodial, it started the year with $202,000. It seems that they've spent $79,708. <laughs> and a year before, at the same time, they only spent 42352 It looks like there's, if I'm doing the math right, about an 88% increase in overtime. And I'm just curious the reason for that. I mean, I'm sure there's a reason. It just kind of jumped out at me. So maybe we could ask. We'll look at it. I could tell you because I know those things off the top of my head. But I'll keep you in suspense. We'll put it in writing. And no, uh, I'm kidding. Um, we'll ask Public Works and Finance. Sometimes it can be um, misleading the way they're listed in the time frames and from different uh, transfers. But we'll look into it and we'll get you an answer right away, Counselor. Okay. Thank you. Now, I'm very excited. Uh, at this juncture. You know, we're always listening to people and vendors and people who, uh, you know, propose things to the town. We have different people who call up uh, all of the time in regard to software services and phone services. And we send those things, the mayor sends them, and sometimes we get different opportunities from Congress people or our state <coughs> reps. And we pass those on to directors to explore because we're always willing to listen to see if we can do something better. Uh, one of the things that I said that we would like to do, and it ties in nicely with one of the issues that has come up uh, over the last few months about marketing the town, about promoting the town. And if you look to our website, it's deficient in that regard. So when we got a call from a company called CGI uh, several months ago uh, to ask if they, we would be interested in them doing public service announcements for the town, basically two a year for three years, 
at no cost, but that we would put their name up there and they would be able to promote business saying they're doing it for the town. Uh, we did due diligence. We checked with some area towns. Um, we looked at their sites and we were impressed with the quality of the ads and we talked to people in those towns and, and they were very happy with what they did. So we said, go ahead and do it. So uh, I tasked the assistant town manager to undertake this project because a lot of the work had to be done <coughs> internally. That's why they're doing it for free because we're doing a lot of the, uh, the, um, the work on it including the themes, which uh, public service announcements we wanted to do, who we wanted to be interviewed, uh, the concepts, and then actually writing the scripts, doing the editing, and also Maya Matthews from my office, who has a talent for this area. They worked collaboratively. Uh, they worked very, very hard. They spent a lot of time on it. Uh, I'm happy to report that the final edits uh, are completed, and we're going to show them to the council, and it is our intention, with your blessing, to put them on our website tomorrow. <coughs> I, I'm really thrilled about this. I think it puts the, the town in the light it should be in and the positive uh, it shows all of the great things and a, a lot of the things in our community that make them feel great and I think it's wonderful now one place people will be able to go and access it uh, when they're considering a place to go look at and you'll see the different categories we picked I think we did a good job uh, going throughout the community at different levels and from different perspectives to show what a unique and wonderful place this is to live <coughs> Kasha Chris provided a great introduction to this, Welcome. so um, I will be showing you. So in July, these uh, two videographers uh, came from CGI. I spent two full days with them going around to different town facilities, meeting different town staff, and also to some local businesses. Um, so this is, and then on top of that, Maya also provided them with a lot of footage from previous town events just to add to the mix here, so we had a good variety. Um, so I will show you these clips. Um, there are six themes, as Chris alluded to. There's a welcome video, an economic development video, First responders, quality of life, nature and community, and an adult day center video. They're about uh, 60 seconds to 90 seconds each, so this won't take too long, don't worry. Um, but I won't keep you in suspense any longer. Hold on, um, I'm going to oh. just interject one thing. <laughs> uh, it's like movie night, but one thing, she jogged my memory, and uh, Bob T. Katz brought it up earlier. And I'd like to report, it's interesting when you look at census and numbers and populations, and recently an area town said, you know, they're growing. So it got me to thinking because in Enfield, we've been losing population, prison population, and they've closed some facilities, which is good news, and it's over 700 people. So I asked Kosh to look into it because I said, if we're in the, the numbers from last year to this year, actually to the positive a little, little bit, and yet we lost 700 people because they consider them residents. Well, if we stayed that close, doesn't that mean that we actually had <coughs> new residents that are living in the community? voluntarily go up. Right. So she's done some preliminary work, and I know for a fact that some of the new developments, such as uh, Mayfield, those are hundreds of residents. We've talked to them. Those are new residents. So most of those people came from out of state. So it didn't seem to make sense to me to think that we were just stasis, that we were level. I think that we've added hundreds of people to Enfield. And I'm going to have Kasha look further, because the way they calculate and keep records, department of what was department? Health. The, the, board, the Department of Health, Labor, it's not always apples to apples. And I mean this sincerely. Bob comes to my office. He's a very good researcher. He's very good at statistics and numbers. So I would invite Bob. He's going to be coming to see me. If he would like to work on this with us, I really would like to know. Because I think it's, it's an unknown, hidden truth that we've added a, a lot of uh, residential population to Enfield, more than is being reported and more than many other communities. So I think that that would be good news and I think it's something that we're going to research. But that's a segue into this because this is an attempt to bring more of those people here. All right. Please let me know if it's too loud or quiet. <laughs> where we invest in our future. Incorporated in 1683, Enfield, Connecticut sits in Hartford County and is home to Lego American Headquarters, Brooks Brothers Corporate Office, and Eppendorf, among many other manufacturers. Enfield has invested in its infrastructure, as evident by ongoing projects, such as the current renovation of the JFK Middle School and the Water Pollution Control Plant upgrade. Town services like the Enfield Child Development Center Senior Center, new library technology, recreation center, and access to public transportation bring our community together. Our newly renovated Enfield High School and Asmanta Community College will provide you with the tools to jumpstart your future. Economic investments aim to revitalize Thompsonville and attract young professionals and entrepreneurs 
will have a lasting impact on community development for years to come. While our innovative, full-service police department and EMS professionals will be sure to keep you safe. Stay tuned to see everything Enfield has to offer. In Enfield, we are planning our future. loved one who needs assistance with daily activities and personal care, the Enfield Adult Day Center can help. A home away from home, our professionals at the Enfield Adult Day Center take a personalized approach to cater to each of our clients' needs, making them feel welcome and comfortable. Throughout the day, staff will engage our clients in a variety of activities, including exercise, entertainment, gardening, and field trips. Our licensed nurse on site and compassionate social worker provide medical services for your loved ones. The services, care, and companionship offered by the Enfield Adult Day Center help us recreate and maintain a happy, healthy community. In Enfield, we are supporting our future. All roads lead to Thompsonville. From our long-standing family-owned businesses to our newest additions, we can follow the path to success right to the heart of Enfield. From the north, south, east, and west, our small town values with big city amenities are evident by our wonderful businesses. The businesses in town support our goals of quality and community while providing entertainment for our residents and visitors. Combining quaint charm and beautiful architecture with quality services is the spirit of the town of Enfield, where you only have to turn the next corner to find what you are looking for. To continue our success, the town is now working to revitalize Thompsonville Village by creating a town center called Higgins Park. It is anticipated to include a band shell, new pool, recreation center, walking trail, and dog park. The vision for a vibrant and sustainable atmosphere for our residents and visitors is evident by the collaboration between the town of Enfield government, administrative staff, and our community. In Enfield, we are building our future. In Enfield, we strive to build a sense of community through our year-round events, public amenities, and local parks. With festivals in every season, like our 4th of July celebration, Family Day, Earth Day Fair, Veterans Day Parade, and Torchlight Parade, there's always an occasion to celebrate with friends and neighbors. Our local farmer's market appeals to our foodies and craft lovers while creating healthier, fresher eating habits among our residents and visitors. With 50 raised beds, the community garden is available to be rented by local citizens and includes the use of tools, seeds, and starter plants, as well as educational sessions and a friendly atmosphere. Get outside and enjoy the beautiful New England scenery by taking a stroll through one of the <coughs> many parks like Stanford River State Park or Brainerd Park. In Enfield, we are inspiring our future. First responders are dedicated to keeping this town, its residents, and its visitors safe 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Our EMS department protects 34 square miles of the town, responding primarily to 911 emergencies. We also have a partnership with the fire departments, offering vital CPR and first aid training to our community. The Enfield Police Department is a full-service, nationally accredited law enforcement agency. The department is organized <coughs> in various units, including uniform patrol, canine teams, a detective bureau, traffic unit, school resource officers, and an explorer and auxiliary program. Our focus is to promote cooperation and collaboration between officers and our community. Our five area fire districts serve and protect our community at a moment's notice and work in harmony with their brother and sister firefighters, police officers, and medical professionals. We thank the Enfield First Responders for their exceptional service and trust them to keep us safe. In Enfield, we are protecting our future. something 
to offer everyone in every season. The Enfield Central Library and the historic Pearl Street branch provide resources and programming to engage residents of all ages. We offer story times, musical instrument lending, arts programs, one-on-one -on -one technology assistance, a cookbook club, and so much more. The library has something for everyone. We invite residents to visit our recreation division located in the Angelo Romagna Activity Center to register for swim lessons, a yoga class, to play basketball, go on a bus trip, or play at summer camp. The Enfield Senior Center provides social, educational, and recreational opportunities designed to enrich the mind, body, and spirit at our state-of-the-art facility. Come check out the classes, fitness center, concerts, or programs that are offered on a regular basis. Enfield Public Schools aims to build a world-class school system of tomorrow, today while at Nuntuck Community College offers associate degrees and certification programs right here in our backyard. Experience what this town has to offer. In Enfield, we are providing for our future. Those are our videos. Um, as Chris said, um, they will be available website beginning tomorrow right on the home page as long as everybody approves. And um, thank you. And if you have any questions. <laughs> thank you. Anyone have any questions? Councilor Hamler. Can we put them on ETV also? I believe so. I'll double check, but I believe so. Anyone else? No. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, I'll just tell you, we had somebody else uh, come forward and they wanted to do a, a promotional video for the town. So the mayor and I and the, the uh, uh, superintendent of school sat through about an hour presentation and it was a three minute video and they were going to do sort of this kind of thing and then at the end they said and you know the production cost is thirty thousand dollars so I'm not saying you know the cost but this was a film crew that came in and spent days and with the time the town put in it doesn't sound out of sorts to me but I would just like to commend Maya and Kosh for doing this and I think it's really going to be something wonderful to have on our website for people considering the town to come in to bury to look at any one of these areas and I think they can't help but be impressed and I'd like to thank Kasha and Maya okay. for their hard work great all right moving on to item 10 town attorney report Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Town Council. Congratulations to all of the council members. I wish you a very meaningful and successful next two years. I have a few things I wanted to comment on. First of all, Mr. Sheridan's comment about the sinking fund. My understanding is that's been thoroughly vetted by the Bond Council, and there are certainly, oh, certainly. The sinking fund has been vetted by Bond Council, and it's an appropriate mechanism to use for your budgeting and your planning. Solid waste ordinance, we will be um, fast tracking that. I know it has been um, on our books to do, and we were, as I think I shared before, the state had a model ordinance, and Public Works had looked at that and was trying to um, make the changes that we want to basically through your subcommittee that looked at it to go ahead and bring it forward to match what the state wants in terms of all the requirements necessary and, and it's a big undertaking but we have a draft and we're just trying to fine tune some of the, the some of the key points that we don't want to be missed out having you miss out on there's a big case that came down a week ago for the um, from the trial court it was a huge victory for municipalities we weren't directly involved but ccm was one of the plaintiffs and there were other towns that were also involved it had to do with municipal gain and some of you are familiar with that basic concept <coughs> i just want to read a couple of lines the plaintiffs were ccm the public the office of consumer council excuse me it's town of sharon the statute that was being considered was 16233 and this is what it provides each town shall have the right to occupy and use for any purpose without payment one gain upon each public utility pole now what municipal gain is for those of you that don't know gain is referred to gain referred to in the statute is a physical space on a utility pole or on an underground duct system to which a municipality may affix communication wiring and equipment and the reason that's important is historically this was only interpreted to be for municipal purposes this change in the statute which happened in 2013 was for any purpose 
the, pla the original plaintiffs in the case, the plaintiffs in the case to the Superior Court, took issue with the fact that the public uh, pura determined that the towns were not allowed to use it for any purpose. They said it was only for a municipal purpose. So to the extent that the municipalities wanted to affix and use it for internet for their residents, the public utilities had an issue with that. What the Superior Court said was, no, this is not your business to make a determination about. They believe that this is something for a higher court and essentially said that the public utility uh, Pura could not make that kind of a determination. So it's a big victory and I will say it's only a trial court case and the likelihood is that there will be an appeal to the Supreme Court or to the probably to the appellate court and my suspicion is it will be lifted up to the Supreme Court. Even this trial court judge said that it looked as though this was headed for more scrutiny. It wasn't going to just stop there. So I don't know if you have any questions about it. It's, it's, it is a big victory. It's not something that maybe directly affects us, but municipal gain is something that's gone on for over 100 years. It, it was something allowed back in 1905 under telegraph and telephone poles. It was extended to be all utility poles in um, 1994, and now you know, the statutory change has been that the municipality can use it, quote, for any purpose. So we'll see if that's something that holds up <coughs> further along the line. I know it's, it's utility information is not spellbinding to a lot of people, and um, I don't know the extent to which everyone's interested in it, but it is a big case. Councilman Bosco. Does this have anything to do with, uh, I remember back a few years back, we had the broadband that wanted to go throughout town. Yeah. And then I heard nothing more about it. Right. Yeah, that was that's that's a good question. We wondered the same thing. I mean, they they had pitched their idea all over the country, and when we had done some research about it, there were some serious issues about the legitimacy of it. But yeah, I think that the idea is if they could affix to <coughs> the municipality's gain, then they wouldn't have to worry about the cost. Where you know, I don't know that that's the intent of this statute is for these other people to kind of piggyback on the town's, the town's right to have this free gain. Any other questions? So I'm sure you'll be seeing more about it. Okay. Uh, all set, Maria? I think so. Okay. Moving Thank on you. to item 11, report any special committees. Councilman Mahler. A JFK Building Committee update. Uh, they went to Planning and Zoning and approved the application on November 14th, so that's good news. On November 26th, the team goes to the state uh, for the initial drawing reviews. Uh, this is the agency that says we are eligible for full reimbursement. So that's good news, too. That's it's moving along fast. Uh, the next meeting is th this Thursday, November 21st, uh, 630 in the Enfield Room. Thank, Thank you. you. No other reports? Hudson Heller. Um, I don't really have a report. I just uh, I'm excited about all the subcommittees and the liaisons, and one of them is uh, economic development. And um, there's a workshop this Thursday, so I'm really looking forward to it. Okay. Moving on to item 12, old business uh, items A, one and two appointments. We have none on page one. Moving on to the top of page two, three through nine, we have none. Item 10, do I have a motion to remove from the table? By Councilor Sakala, by Councilor Riley. All those in favor of moving from the table by a show of hands. Opposed? Abstentions? 11 in favor, 0 against. Do I have a nomination? Sure. Councilor Sakala? Uh, Leanne Boyer. Bo Boy Boyer. Boyer. Oh, yeah. Leanne said. Boyer. Got it. Do we have a nomination? Second. Second by Council Muller. Do I have a, a motion to close nominations? So moved. Councilor uh, Sparaza, seconded by Councilor Muller. All those in favor by, to, sh to close nominates by a show of hands. Opposed, 11 in favor, 0 against. Any other discussion on the main motion? Hear none, roll call please. Councilor Bosco? Four. Councilor Sakala? Ian Boyer? Councilor Hemler? Four. Councilor Kiner? Four. Mayor Ludwig? Four. Councilor Mangini? Ian Boyer? Councilor Muller? Four. Councilor Riley? Four. Council Faraza? Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak? Four. Councilor Unger? Four. 
11 in favor, none opposed, no abstentions. Items 11, 12, and 13 stay on the table. Do I have a motion to move item 14 from the table? <laughs> I'll move. By Councilor Muller, seconded by Councilor Riley. All those in favor of moving from the table by a show of hands. Opposed, abstentions. 11 in favor, zero against. Do I have a nomination, please? Yes. Um, Councilor Muller. Colleen Wrighty. The motion's, uh, do I have a second? Second. Second by Councilor Spraw. Do I have a motion to close nominations? So moved. By second. Councilor uh, Sakala. Second by Councilor Riley. All those in favor of closing nominations by a show of hands. Opposed, abstentions. We have 11 in favor, zero against. Any discussion on the main motion? Hearing on roll call, please. Councilor Bosco. Four. Councilor Sakala. Colleen Reedy. Councilor Hamler. Four. Ca Councilor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Colleen Reedy. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Riley. Four. Councilor Ferraza. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Four. Councilor Ungeyer. Four. That's 11 in favor, none opposed, no abstentions. Items 15 and 16 on page two remain on the table. Item 17 remains on the table. Do I have a motion to move number 18 from the table? So by Councilor Muller. Second. Second by Councilor Riley. All those in favor for a move from the table by a show of hands. Opposed, abstentions. 11 in favor, zero against. Do I have a nomination? Councilor Muller. Not highlighted. It should have been. We met the, it's in the packet. Greg Stokes. We have a nomination of Greg Stokes. Do I have a second? second. By Councilor Riley. I have a nomination of second. Do I have a, a motion to close nominations? Okay. By Councilor Muller. Second. Someone. Second by Deputy Mayor Suzak. All those in favor of closing the nomination by a show of hands. Opposed, abstentions. 11 in favor, zero against. Any discussion on the main motion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councillor Bosco? Four. Councillor Sakala? Against. Councillor Hamler? Four. Councillor Kiner? Abstain. I'm sorry. Abstain. Abstain. Council Mayor Ludwig? Four. M Councillor Mangini? Four. Councillor Muller? Four. Councillor Riley? Four. Councillor Ferraza? Four. Councillor Suzak? Four. Councillor Ungeyer? Four. Looks like we have nine in favor, one opposed, no absten one abstention. Moving on to items 19 through 21, remain on the table. In item B, appointments one through nine, uh, we have none for the town manager. Items 10 through 17 on page four, we have none from the town manager. Item C, appointments, P and Z commission appointed to council approved. We have none. Item D, discussion of roof replacements, remains on the table. New business, items A, the consent agenda, B, the appointments by town council, C, appointments town manager. D appointments, P and Z commission approved, council commission appointed, council approved. We have none. Moving on to item 14, items for discussion. The consent agenda then moved the miscellaneous. So as in item three, one, two, and three. Appointments A under uh, new uh, items for discussion, one, two, three, and four remain on the table. Moving on to item B, appointments, town manager appointed, council approved. We have none. Item C, appointments, P and Z appointed, council approved. We have none. Items D, E, F, and G have been moved to miscellaneous. And we move to miscellaneous. We have the consent agenda. Items A, 1, 2, and 3. Is there any discussion on the consent agenda? Hearing none, by a show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? 11 in favor, 0 against. Moving on to item D. Let me get there, sorry. No, we've got to do No, no, they're not, they're not approved. We don't have any nominations for that. No, they're, they're just the letters. Yeah, but they're we don't like, we don't need to do anything. Right, and this one's just. It right, it stays on new items for discussion. We don't have any of those. We have none of those uh, applications in. I know we do have one. The housing authority. Oh, we do. Yes. Was that moved? Yeah. Yeah. The other ones are just discussion Okay. All right. So then, before we move on, uh, did we did we appoint? We move that to miscellaneous. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Okay. So then we move on to item. We don't have to accept, we just, one and two, it's just we got their resignation letters right. in. Right. Moving on to item three, the housing authority. Do we have a, a nomination for the housing authority? Do we have a nomination for the housing authority? I'll nominate Mary Craft. Mary Craft. 
Nominated by Councillor uh, Mangini, seconded by Deputy Mayor Suzak. Do we have a by a show? Do we have uh, anyone like to not make a motion to close nominations? Motion Deputy, to close. Second. Deputy Mayor Suzak, second by Councillor Muller. All those in favor of closing nomination by a show of hands. Extensions against 11 in favor, zero against. Any discussion on the main motion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councillor Bosco, four. Councillor Hemler, four. Oh, or me, four. Councillor Sakala, I'm sorry. Councillor Hemler, four. Councillor Kiner? Four. Mayor Ludwig? Four. Councillor Mangini? Mary Carrasca. Councillor Muller? Four. Councillor Riley? Four. Councillor Ferraza? Four. Mayor, Deputy Mayor Suzak? Four. Councillor Ungeyer? Four. We have Levin in favor, none opposed, no abstentions. Sorry, my bad on that one. No, that's it, was it is because I know I know we don't have to accept the resignation yeah, just know, the shows I, on the agenda I know. sorry my bad um, moving on to item D discussion resolution for request to transfer funds for public safety click it or ticket grant of eleven thousand three hundred dollars resolved in the accordance with chapter 6 section 8 F of the town charter the following transfers hereby made to police services for overtime, 11300 from general fund revenue, grants other state revenue of 11300 Certification that the above funds are available as of November 12, 2019 by John Wilcox and approved by Christopher Bronson. By uh, Councillor Muller, Second. by Councillor Riley. And this is, just, I know, annual grant that we... Well, the chief has come because okay. we have three new members and we've asked if he would come up. Um, so if there were, he would give a brief explanation, overview. And also we've been recognized in one state awards in regard to this enforcement. So I, I thought it was important uh, for the chief to explain it. And to follow up on your earlier comments, I, I would like to commend the chief because he was the point person that oversaw <laughs> the search for our missing person. And still today, there are signs up around town uh, right. put up by the Info Police Department. They have not stop their search and I commend him and also in regard to the uh, item that chief former chief Sfraza had uh, spoken to that occurred at the high school again uh, the chief oversaw that uh, and he does a incredible job of keeping me informed and the council and oversees these and he is to be commended for it and I thank him thank you sir welcome sir good evening sir good evening ladies and gentlemen uh, I can uh, provide a light overview on both of these if this would be yeah, I mean, helpful to you. Your general grant, I know we've done it a couple, maybe just, I know you don't, I don't know, whatever details you can provide. I certainly can, thank you. The uh, the DUI grant, both of these are state grants, both of them are 100% fully uh, uh, reimbursable back to the town. The uh, state grant this year is uh, for DUI enforcement is $129,821, 100% reimbursable through the state. Uh, administratively, it's done four times a year. There are four reporting periods. The funds are effectively transferred in advance and we're reimbursed after each reporting period. Uh, this, grant, this, this grant funds DUI shifts that run from November 22nd, 2019 through September 12th, 2020, and they allow us to fund numerous roving patrols uh, which we effectuate between 5 p.m. and 4 a.m. and a limited number of DUI checkpoints that are uh, put in place on, on specific days, specific times when we think they'd be most effective. The Click It or Ticket grant is seatbelt based, as the name implies. Uh, each year we have put in for this and each year we've received it. It's $11,300 this year. There are two waves of enforcement. Once again, the two waves run through set periods. We're reimbursed for the money that's expended uh, back from the state to the town. This consists of spot checks with spotters calling in violations to officers ahead beyond the increase in compliance rates that we're looking for. It's also very worthwhile for the state to compare the pre and post uh, compliance rates based on the enforcement that occurs during those periods. I'm certainly available to answer any questions or respond to any concerns that you might have. And, and I would just say, perhaps the chief, before the question can elaborate, do we, we've received number one from the Department of Transportation in regard to click it and ticket in the past, and also in recognition of our enforcement efforts on the DUI. Perhaps, chief, you can tell that we were one of two recipients, I believe us, and and the state police of the portable, the mobile DUI uh, vehicle, which was at a, it was two hundred fifty thousand dollars that we received. Perhaps you could just explain that a little bit and how we utilize it. But again, that was an accolade to the Enfield Police Department for their uh, aggressive enforcement against DUI in the town. 
The DUI vehicle is, is an incredible asset for us to have. It is what we deploy when we run checkpoints. It goes out of town as part of Crest enforcement, I'm sorry, uh, as part of Metro traffic, uh, regional motor vehicle enforcement efforts. It also doubles as our command post when we have a significant event uh, and we need access to computers and workrooms and workstations. Uh, that, that vehicle has performed quite admirably for our purposes. And it is a testament. Uh, I very much appreciate the kind words that were offered as to the police department earlier in the evening. Um, I continue to be impressed personally and professionally by the quality of the work that the men and women of the agency do. Council Sfarraza. Chief, in addition to the DWI and seatbelt, the <coughs> offshoot of that would be narcotic fines, felony warrants, uh, suspended people. So there's a host of other benefits other than the intended benefit that we've seen over the year. Would that be true? Distracted driving, individuals that are wanted, suspended licenses, no insurance, misuse of plates. The, uh, the list would be considerable. Is the cost remain co constant or is it gone up, got the grants? Maybe? The amount of the grants, no, it varies. It varies, varies based on the amount of money the state uh, makes available to us and, and the numbers that we're able to generate from year to year. So you mentioned in your presentation that you know, the state tracks before and after. Generally, I mean, high level without getting into specific, how have we tracked, so to speak? I mean, you know, meaning the effectiveness of the grant. So in, we in the service. Yeah, so we are actually down this year, unfortunately, in terms of the money that's been provided for the DUI enforcement. It's lower than normal, right? Um, and that's troubling to me. Um, it actually was one of the things we spoke about, if you recall, when we did our presentation last month. That's why I was tying it back to that. Yeah, and I think there are, I mean, there are some. Um, Justifications is a word that concerns me, but there are some explanations behind that that primarily drive to the number of officers that we've had available over the last year. Uh, but in general, our motor vehicle enforcement rates are something that I'm looking at uh, and waiting anxiously for the end of the year so I can compare full year to full year. Uh, I, I'm aware of the, what you're uh, referring to, and I'm on top of that as yeah, well. Yeah, no worries. No, I just figured, you know, you're just curious. For well, and, and I think to tie into that, um, with the swearing in that uh, Councillor Hemler alluded to, perhaps you could say now for the first time in how long we are now at our full strength of 95 officers. Perhaps you give a brief comment upon that. <laughs> to see if you're paying attention. I am, uh, I am thrilled to report, and, uh, uh, and, I, and I thank the council so very deeply for the support over the last year, uh, year and eight months that I have been here. But with the swearing in from uh, that, that you attended that most recently occurred, we are now at our 95 uh, officer target staffing level. Um, unfortunately, 12 of those officers, and that's the nature of what we do, are somewhere between the training academy and the field training program. Uh, but you wouldn't want your officers any other way. You wouldn't want them to, to, to go through anything less than the vibrant, robust training that they do receive. It's just thrilling to me to look at 95 spots and see 95 names. Councilor Strauss. So, Chief, it's, it's the 12 officers you're talking about. They're not taking calls. So on paper, we have 95. You're not running with 95. And in addition to that, we have people deployed in the military. We have people on long-term injury. So we're still, in terms of actual people on the street, way low. Uh, that is correct. I mean, and in response and in follow-up to, to something I know that's near and dear to the council's heart, when we get to 95 full-time working bodies, I would expect that number to be good and the overtime to drop. I just don't want to mislead you to let you think that 95 right now is 95. Unfortunately, it's 95 less the 12. And once again, that's just the nature of what we do. Any other questions? And again, uh, I said earlier, I know you were involved. Good call of setting it up quickly with the search. I mean, I know it came a while, and you worked with the folks who called and worked, you know, directly with you. And, and when we talk about community policing, which is what some of the things we've really chatted about, other than just walking the beat, you know, those things are important. You know, that again, it's when someone says, "Hey, we got an issue, and we're helping you folks," jumped right in, and I know you made the right call there. So thank you. The credit goes to the men and women of the department. Yep. yep. Thank you, sir. Appreciate thank you. It. Thank you. Roll call, please. Councillor Bosco? Four. Councillor Sakala? Four. Councillor Hemler? Oh, four. Councillor Kiner? Four. Mayor Ludwig? Four. Councillor Mangini? Four. Councillor Muller? Four. Councillor Riley? Four. Councillor Faraza? Four. Deputy Mayor Souza? Four. Councillor Ungar? Four. 
That's 11 in favor, none opposed, no abstentions. Moving on to item E, request to transfer funds for public safety DUI enforcement grant, $129,821. Resolve in the accordance of Chapter 6, Section 8F of the Town Charter, the following transfer is hereby made. Two, D and two, two DUI enforcement program of $129,821 from the DUI enforcement program of $129,821. Certified that the above amounts uh, the above funds are available on October 25th, 2019 by John Wilcox and approved by the town manager, Christopher W. Bronson. Second. Councilor Muller, seconded by Deputy Mayor Suzak. Chief just answered the questions. Any other comments or concerns? Roll call, please. Councilor Bosco. Four. Councilor Sakala. Four. Councilor Hamler. Four. Councilor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Riley. Four. Councilor Ferraza. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Four. Councilor Ungar. Four. That's 11 in favor, none opposed, no abstentions. Under miscellaneous, moving on to item F. Resolution authorizing the town manager to sign the agreement with the Associated Building Wreckers, Inc. Whereas the, Enfield, the town of Enfield issued a request for proposal for the demolition of structures at 26-32 Church Street and at 28 South River Street. Whereas the Associated Building Wreckers, Inc. was determined to be the lowest, quali lowest qualified and responsible proposer. And whereas the actual cost for the project is more than the amount budgeted for these properties in the troubled properties account. And whereas the additional funds are available in the property maintenance program account where property maintenance violation fines are collected. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Enfield Town Council authorized the town manager to sign the agreement with the Associated Building Wreckers, Inc. to complete the demolition of the structures of these properties. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Enfield Town Council authorized the Authorizes the, use, authorizes the use of the property maintenance program account funds to utilize in order to complete the project. Submitted by Nelson Teresio, Director of Deputy Director of Economic and Community Development on November 18, 2019. So moved. By Deputy Mayor Suzak, seconded by Councillor Muller. I know, I mean, I know you, uh, Nelson, yeah, I think. Nelson, yeah, all um, the good work come forward. He should give a little overview. Yeah, just public. to give you an overview. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basically, this is uh, a result of our very uh, attentive and aggressive blight enforcement of the ordinance. Um, we're really taking action. It's a comprehensive program, has a lot of moving parts, and there are rotating funds. But basically, our entire intent is to get people to have their property in compliance so that they are good neighbors and that people don't have to look out their window and see blighted property uh, across the street. So we're working towards that. We try to do it voluntarily, and when that fails, then we are, are left to utilize the devices that state st statute has allowed us to implement via ordinance for blight and clean and lean. In some circumstances, we can actually go in and cut the lawn or do certain things and then we lean the property uh, and we collect it at a later time when the property sold or the person wants to uh, perhaps uh, you know come up and clean the the uh, the decks so to speak and they pay it off um, in blight enforcement it's for other purposes and in that circumstance we don't have the right to go on the property but we lean the property and at some point uh, hopefully the, the people want to comply or as we've seen we've we've actually foreclosed on quite a few properties uh, and we're going to just you know foreclose and, and take the properties uh, that are in a state of disrepair some of them are abandoned and we're going to do the work or we're going to demolish them and then we're going to give them to our on-call realtor and we're going to sell them and get them back on the uh, the property rolls and also enhance the neighborhoods. So this is in that group. These properties have been eyesores. They have been troubled properties. We've worked very hard to identify them, to get them. The, the council has um, designated certain funds. We've used funds. And as I say, these, these funds are rotating. As we sell properties, the money will be replenished. We get certain grants. We get certain fines that are voluntarily paid. We didn't have enough in there to do the full demolition. Um, in one of the accounts so this clearly is very transparent and, and tells where we're taking it from to come up with the amount we got seven proposals it was very actively pursued by contractors to do these demolitions and the total amount is 333894 Nelson will tell you what the history of the properties are uh, a little bit about the process and why we're asking you to move forward to make these improvements these the, these wrecking balls are ready to go sure. good evening council welcome uh, the Church Street property was acquired by the town in 2017 in back taxes for $18,000. Um, that's the property that has the uh, burned down residential structure. There's also two other residential structures. So there's, there's three total residential structures on that property. South River Street, 28 South River, uh, also three residential structures. It has multiple garages in the back. It used to be a former welding shop. Um, the town actually uh, purchased that property back in 2018. It's on the river 
riverfront, we wanted to have control of that property. We acquired that property for about $28,000. Both of these properties are considered top 10 troubled properties uh, on our a top 10 list. Uh, both are vacant parcels. Uh, part of my task here in town when I first got here was to hire an environmental consultant to do the hazardous building materials abatement. We've completed that. We prepared specifications. As Chris mentioned, we went out to, we went, we went out to bid, public formal bid process. The bids were opened on October 17th. We got a total of seven bids. The bids ranged from uh, 333000 up to $552,000. Um, like I said, it's not just two pieces of property, I mean two structures. We're looking at six residential properties, multiple garages. Um, so you know the bids came in quite high, and we had to find out ways of getting other funding in place. And we looked at the Clean and Lean program to um, utilize funds to support the project. So we have funding coming from the Troubled Properties account and the Clean and Lean account. So it's a 60-day construction window. We want, we're hoping to start in a couple weeks because with, with your approval tonight, we can begin the process of awarding the contract and also beginning the pre-construction meeting. The, um, the general contractor has to get all his utility disconnect permits, the building permit, I mean the demolition permit. So it's a process. So we want to begin going uh, within the next couple weeks so we finish before you know it gets, the weather gets pretty bad out there. And I'll just tell you, Mayor, people say, you know, are you doing something with blighted property? They call. We have three uh, blight officers, former police officers, who go out there and do a really <laughs> good job. They try to get people into compliance voluntarily. Then they start the process of blight or clean and lean. They've been very successful. The council supported them. You go back a few years, we didn't have anybody. And I will just tell you, people say, well, this is a lot of money. But you know what? The, the whole process pays for itself. I sent out a memo, and we'll make it available. Since 2015, the enforcement of blight, we have collected brought in in fines just shy of $500,000. We have on the books fines that have accrued on property that have not been paid of about $500,000. So it's been a highly successful, a highly successful, successful program because we put the personnel and we updated the blight ordinance to make it workable so that we can do these things. So this money is being moved around, but really it, it isn't in the end taxpayer money. This is money that's being paid by those who don't comply with the law and the fines and the clean and lean uh, uh, funding is what promotes it. And it's, it's a cyclical. And as I say, as soon as these are cleared, we'll put them on the market. We'll get, I think, a good money for them. And that money will go back into these funds to do the next 10 top troubled properties. Any questions, Councilor Strauss? I just want to say, not only do I support this 100%, I can't tell you how many times people have asked me, what are we doing with those houses on Church Street? Sure. What are we doing with these blighted properties? And you know, like the manager just said, we're going to get them back on the tax rolls. But more importantly, when that wrecking ball hits that first house, landlords or, or the folks that own these blighted properties should take notice that we're not just talking anymore. We're going to fix these houses. We have a duty to the residents in that street, and it's not limited to Thompsonville. And I'm glad we have a, a, a top 10 list. You have a great team. Your blight officers are great. And this is well, way overdue. Thank and, you. And Councilman, we actually uh, did reach out to all the neighboring abutting property owners and notifying, notifying them of the demolition and asked them about you know, fences, property lines, to make sure that we're not knocking down anything that's not town sure. property. Sure. Thank you. Councilor Hamler. Um, I live uh, within walking distance of Church Street. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? You know, I think the beauty once these properties get rebuilt, then they can apply for the first time homeowners uh, program if they're first time homeowners. So it comes full circle. Sure. It comes first full circle that we're actually trying to get people in and help them again, in properties in part of town. So it's not just taking, it's actually getting them back, and then we're gonna give, hopefully give back and you qualify for the first time homeowners, if that's what you are when you purchase those properties. Correct. Which is beautiful, I mean, that's the thing about it. Any other questions, Councilor Bosco? Yeah, I'm glad to see this happen. Uh, you know, throughout the time, people say, you guys are doing nothing, <laughs> but it takes so long to get something done. But this, is, this should be a clear, Cut thing to everybody. At, no, we are doing stuff, and there's going to be more to come. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions or concerns? Well done. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Roll call, please. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Hemler. Four. Councillor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Mangini. Four. 
Councillor Muller. Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Councillor Savarasa. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Four. Councillor Ongeyer. Four. It's 11 in favor, none opposed, no abstentions. Item G, res and under, under miscellaneous resolution authorizing the town manager to sign a real estate purchase contract for town owned property. Excuse me, whereas the town of Enfield owns a property known as 46 Cottage Green, whereas pursuant to Connecticut General Statute 8 24, the Planning and Zoning Commission at its August 8, 2019 made a favorable recommendation to sell the property. Whereas pursuant to Connecticut General Statute 7163E, the Town Council held a public hearing on September 3, 2019 regarding the purchase sale of the, pro the proposed sale of the property and whereas the town listed the property for sale. Now, therefore, be it resolved, Christopher W. Bronson, Town Manager, or his designee is auth authorized to sign the real estate purchase contract on behalf of the Town of Enfield for the sale of 46 Cottage Green to Brothers and Sons Construction LLC. Be it refer further resolved that Christopher W. Bronson, Town Manager, or his designee is authorized to sign all documents, including the deed on behalf of the Town of Enfield pertaining to the sale of the property to Brothers and Sons Construction LLC, subject to review and approval by the Town Attorney. Submitted on November 14, 2019 by the Town Attorney's Office mm -hmm. by Councillor Muller, by Councillor Mangini. Yes, again, this is part of this is part of the circle. It's part of the success story. Uh, this is the reason we went out and get a realtor to be on call because this is one of the first properties that uh, has successfully been marketed. Uh, early in the evening, we brought a proposal to the council as appropriate in executive session under real estate, and I can now report we'll insert the uh, the sales price will be forty five thousand dollars. This is a property that has uh, been there <laughs> empty, has been the bane of the neighborhood, uh, but it's a it has great potential. It's a historic tutor, and it will be restored and be a wonderful uh, addition to the uh, neighborhood. We took it for taxes, back taxes, which were around, I think we said 33,000. 33, so the town actually selling it for 45,000 will make a profit enough to cover cost of the staff. But much more importantly, um, the developer who's, who's uh, buying it has committed to refurbish it, weather permitting within the next three months, and it will be an occupied home in the neighborhood that is no longer blighted. Um, also, because we've owned it over this ensuing period of time, there are certain blighted conditions, and the incentive for him to complete it within that time, we'll give him a grace period, but then we will let him know we'll work with him, but when the work uh, you know, is completed, we're good to go. If it isn't, then that would be a subject of, of blight enforcement to make sure and give them the incentive. But I think you know they want to go in there, they want to make it uh, a, a respectable uh, property, and again, I think this is part of the success story. We've The council and our staff, we've really, really focused on this like a laser, and we're making every neighborhood better wherever we find blight house by house property by property we take it seriously we have a great team we meet every two weeks and we have everybody you know comes to that meeting and has input and we look at a blighted property and say what's the best way to go here and we try to work with people uh, voluntarily and then if we can't then we utilize the the tools that the town has enacted uh, via the ordinances and I think it's going to make a big difference so we ask that you approve this and we'll sell it and hopefully in three months we're going to have for you the before and after pictures. Yeah, uh, this property, um, as Chris mentioned, it's in a it's an historic neighborhood. It's, there's four cottages there. Uh, we received two, actually two offers for the property. We've accepted the second offer, which is the higher offer, and there's no mortgage contingency with that offer. Um, we did discuss with the, um, with the, with the buyer regarding his plan. We asked for a work plan. There's a three-month work plan that he provided to us, which talks about completing renovating the structure. Um, we are going to discuss our blight ordinances with him as part of the closing. And you know, as, since it's in that historic district, we wanted to make sure he wasn't going to demolish the property because he is a demolition contractor, and that was our main concern. But he said that he's got a three-month window, you know, dependent on weather, of, uh, re of fully restoring the property and putting it back on the tax rolls. Any questions? Again, it's a beautiful little Tudor house in a corner where they're all there, and it's a great little old house in a great neighborhood mm -hmm. that, you know, honestly, as a kid, I used to run the streets, and it was, uh, it's great to see you guys. I mean, in two or in two different resolutions, two different approaches to dealing with blight. Sure. And I know we have other things we're doing as well, so it's not just one size fits all. We're trying to be very flexible, understanding the situation within two different ordinances, two different ways of dealing with blight, and knock on wood, two very successful hopefully outcomes. Absolutely. So, yeah, well done by your staff. Thank you. Roll call, please. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Hemler. Four. Councillor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Mangini. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. 
Councillor Riley? Four. Councillor Ferraza? Four. Count Deputy Mayor Suzak? Four. Councillor Ungar? Four. It's 11 in favor, none opposed, no abstentions. Moving on to item. That's a move, item 16, public communications. Would anyone like to speak for the public at this I mean, the council, excuse me, at this time. Jack. I didn't see this. I saw it. I know. I didn't see this. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. Jack Sheridan, uh, 7 Buchanan Road. Um, first, I'll start with what was just said about the blighted properties. I think it's great. You know how many years I've been coming to these meetings and all the talk and lip service that we've had for resurrecting these properties or doing anything with them and nothing's ever happened and now it's happening. So congratulations, congratulations to you. I, I, it's, it's nothing but good for the town. Uh, so I'll start there. Um, second, our town charter, for which I was on the revision committee the last time, <coughs> uh, there is an emergency section, uh, section uh, five on emergency appropriations. And, uh, and it says that you know you can activate that in times when needed. But it also, you have to stop and think about all the years that we've been in business in this town, running the various councils and managers, that we've never had a sinking fund before. So what brings up the need for a sinking fund? And if you look at, in the, uh, and I'm not sure, in the bonding, uh, section, you know, it, it says in the town charter that uh, the town charter shall have the power to incur indebtedness by use of bonds or notes as provided by the general statutes as revised, subject to the limitations thereof of the provisions of this town charter. And the town charter says you use two-tenths of a percent of the budget. Now, when we were on the committee for the revision, it was brought to us that they wanted to increase that amount. From right now, that would be roughly six hundred and twenty or thirty thousand dollars. If if it was brought to us that gee, we ought to round that off and make it a million. It would make it easier for everybody. And we had a big discussion about it. And Lou Fiore and I discussed it back and forth, and we decided that the whole committee decided that because the votes that we get are to vote you people in to, to do what's right in our best interest, we decided to leave that at the rate that it was because we'd start losing all our ability to control spending. And, uh, okay, uh, but I, I, I just think that anybody out there in TV land that sees that all of a sudden we have a sinking fund, and I'd like to also hit the point that the reason the roofs are in the deplorable condition that they're in is because all the years that the school budget had money in the budget to do the roofs, they didn't do them. Now that's not anybody's fault except the school and, and, and the people that allocated that money without taking care of the roofs. So the reason we find ourselves in this position is poor management of the funds that we were giving to the schools. and. People keep approving these referendums for things that we know we need. But if you look back in the history, we had just approved two large, one, well, each for about $60 million. And then all of a sudden, you we're asked to do another referendum, which, thank you. You know, I do appreciate what Mr. Sheridan is saying about this, but the problem is, is that some of our bigger buildings 
are our schools. Most of our roofs we can do within the referendum limit. We're looking at the police station as the next one that will be done that's a town building. That one will probably be done within the, re the referendum limit. So the problem is, is when you get to these structures that are so large that you have to either account for it in a number of years to, to do the project, or you have to go out to referendum. And something like a roof, and you know what was going on with the complaints at the Henry Barnard School, school roofs should not leak. And I agree with you, Jack, that there should have been something done in probably 2007, but it wasn't. And unfortunately, we're, we're doing a lot of catch up. We're not overfunding these sinking funds. We're funding them within the referendum limit for each year. So really over three years, a CIP could be funded up to that as well. So we are really <coughs> diligently um, using this tool that we have. And I don't believe we're using it for for wants, we're using it for needs. And you know, we, you know, talks to the health department and everybody else, you can't, you just can't have your roofs leaking. It's just not a good thing. So I really appreciate you watching our budget, but we are too as well. Um, and I just wanted to add about the sinking fund. So far, we have gotten money reimbursed from the state to go back into it. So it's not that we're just you know, taking the money and then it's going away. We're at least getting some of it put back in from the state when we make the repairs that unfortunately were not done when they should have been done. But we have to move forward and this is where we are at this point in time. But I think all your con your concerns are definitely more than valid. It's, I think it's just the nature of the beast where we are right now in time. With the sinking fund too, correct me if I'm wrong, Donna, the uh, sinking fund is just just for roofs. It can't be like CIP for trucks or anything else. We locked it in for just roofs. <laughs> well, well, the ones we have right now, the ones we have right now are just for, for roofs and um, major maintenance of buildings, but um, I'm gonna defer to Councilor Bosco because right now we can buy a garbage truck but we are gonna reach a point in time where we cannot buy a vehicle because it will exceed the referendum limit. And that's why we have the vehicle replacement CIP where we have the fixed um, budgetary concern each year, but we're starting to lease vehicles because we lease them for three years or five years and we buy them for a dollar because they're exceeding the amount of money that we can set aside each year for a truck. It's, the costs are going up faster than we can. The sad part is, is uh, you know, I, I didn't really like the sinking funds myself, but right now we're stuck in a position. But the only scary part is right now, all of us are pretty, pretty responsible. The only bad thing about these sinking funds are is what if you get someone in here that's rogue? And, and that's where I think Jack's biggest problem is, and I don't know if we're gonna use sinking funds if there's something we can do, uh, and it may end being a thing in the charter that they can't be used for just willy-nilly stuff, because that's where the sinking fund is, is uh, a little bit, you can get you nervous because you could just use it for uh, you know, decide to put a park in the middle of somewhere and start a sinking fund and and go at it. So I understand where he's talking about where, you know, they're not a good thing. But on the other hand, with the prices of stuff, we, we cannot do it. I mean, it's impossible. Right. And, they have you know, to be, be specifically designed. And where, where he's talking designed. with wants and needs, I, I understand that too. But the, 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 the school roof is a need. I mean, we can't have it raining in the school. But where you gotta be careful is when someone decides that they're gonna wanna use it for a want and and start putting money away for, for a pet project that we don't really need. So I, I know where he's coming from, but at, at this point here, it's just a tough thing because we're, we're stuck in a, a bind right now. 
The only good thing is they're not created through the budget process. They have to be created through resolution. And the resolution has to be specific for what it can be used for. So we have to, you know, you have to be diligent and we have to, you know, <laughs> have confidence that the people will vote for people who are, are physically responsible.